Hello and welcome to Cherry Stem. Uh, we are your hosts, Anna Cherry. Richard Rawl. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we are here today to talk more about Jordan Peterson's uh, Three Forms of Meaning and uh, Management of Complexity, the big academic article that we've been going at for a couple of weeks. Uh, and of course, this is the moment when the cat decides to start playing with all the toys. Yep, the loudest of the toys is the ones he picks, of course. And uh, did we actually start somewhat on time? Like we're fourteen minutes to? late. Oh man, that's like totally on time for oh, us. Oh no, we we would we would do better than that. We oh, actually oh, failed. Okay. Sorry guys, sorry right. about that. <laughs> Everyone has been waiting for us. <laughs> uh, however, I have been uh, getting um, comments and things like that from all of you about being able to support this show. And the way you can do that, uh, and also avoid Patreon, is support the show directly through. Uh, streamlabs.com slash Anna Cherry. It's just like this YouTube channel, uh, except instead of YouTube.com Anna Cherry, it's streamlabs.com slash Anna Cherry. And you can see that at the bottom of our screen. Um, if you would like to uh, join in on a monthly support basis, we do have some perks. And those perks are an after show. Um, check out Challenger Mode um, it's on the screen right now for those of you who are watching the live stream. Otherwise, everyone else can go to patreon.com slash Anna Cherry. <laughs> There's a theme here. <laughs> uh, a lot of slash and a cherries. Um, and check out Challenger Mode. It'll allow you to hang out with us after the show, discuss uh, some of the finer points, um, debate, uh, shoot the shit, um, do whatever um, it is that we do with our patrons afterwards. And you may not know what that is until you become one yourself. Yeah, we've got this, this shit launcher that, you know, you say pull and you fire it and it goes shoot it right out of the air. It's great. It is. It's great. Yeah, it's a good time it's for good, everyone. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we have fun. Uh, on Patreon. So uh, you can do that. Or, of course, uh, as I said before, you can support us directly on Streamlabs. And uh, in fact, that might uh, cause some alert donations to go off. <laughs> but all right. Um, anyway, your views and your uh, shares and other things are important as well. So if you cannot support us financially, don't you worry. You can still support us by following us on Patreon, downloading the, the audio, listening to the podcast whenever it becomes one, one of these days. <laughs> And just generally giving us your attention. Uh, what else have we got? Well, let's get stuck into it. <laughs> get stuck. Sure. All right. So where were we? All right. Where were we? Give me this thing. <laughs> I should probably find <clears throat> the article as well. All right. Looks like we were around page nine. Are you gonna display it so that people can read along if they like? As I can. That's a good idea, good idea. Um, I was just asking um, what a MAP schema is, because I was like, wait a minute, MAP is a is a acronym for something. Uh, did you find? Did you end up finding what the acronym acronym meant? When you, I gave up on it. I had to launch up. the show. It's not a big deal. Oh. I had to do it. Oh, okay. Well, I guess it's not all that important. It's great. We, we kind of know what it is, but... Um, all right, so uh, this section has two. Um, I guess it's, I guess it's just not made any larger. It's like a, like a subsection of a section. Like maybe that's what it is, but it just has it yeah. bolded. Um, I'm just looking at how there's two. There's basically two uh, starting well, like on the on the nine on. The, well, no, if you look at page at the end no, of page nobody's nine. nobody's looking anything. So you're just okay. confusing a little bit. Oh, well, it's at the end of page nine. No, I'm not confusing anything. You just you just, just chill. <laughs> just chill. They're, they're with me. They, they got it. Okay, good, good. All right. Uh, there's th I'm confused. <laughs> well, it's just there's two. He's got two headings here, so it's a little weird. And just let me ramble, God damn it. All right. All right. Um, <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> And uh, the starting the uh, the starting heading the heading before the heading is uh, the, the unknown yes the pre heading <laughs> the unknown chaotic unexplored indeterminate world and then I think that what he's trying to do all, is it's the same it's just didn't format right right something like that maybe because it's there's a colon it's all the same thing is it yeah. I don't know there's and a then uh, and then this section is novelty anomaly and map schema disruption pretty sure the colon makes it okay. All right, the frame, uh, the frame consisting of point A and point B can well be considered a theory-laden map schema. You know, I wonder if he's, he's using any context here from the previous section. I wonder if we need to back up back at all. back up a little bit? Um, well, you know, I know we, re we read that opening section there. 
Um, let's try to remember what it was that we're, that's being talked about. Okay, All we're right. talking about uh, mirror neurons and how they um, let's see. Oh, how mirror neurons basically connect to very deep parts of the brain. Uh, you know, even both, in primates, both you know the in endocrine system. You know, somatic system, basically all of these things. Whereas we're talking area, which is language, right? So, so uh, these the this ability to see and copy goes, you know, really, really deep into our physiology. Um, and let's see. Let me start in the middle of this. Uh, I would definitely here. look uh, keep looking for perhaps some definitions of it. Uh, I just okay. need um, you to take over here for a minute. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, as well as the screen, so that <clears> I can scroll into. A successful joint establishment is such a plan motivationally significant. Okay, yeah. So uh, then we're also talking about how drama and fiction and things like Does that children are symbolic. En children engaged in pretend play can coordinate the motivation. So we talked about the game, right? The, the play right. pretend stuff. They're basically play, playing pretend and how all those things are part of a way to coordinate a group. Uh, and so this is... So, you know, in, uh, so, so combining the individual schemas with the group. Right, and uh, so goals. basically c coming to agreements with, you know, uh, your group mates uh, through the play process is part of the development of the brain that goes very deep, and then so that is how, um, you know, we're, we're kind of, that, that's how our brain ends up developing is through the place, all these different play systems and, and, and through, uh, through different agreements. Mm -hmm. And so it's, <laughs> so right off the bat that says to me, it's like, wow, we were really designed to be in small groups, not in these constantly changing groups. Um, but yeah, this, this could be a good uh, thing to, to just read going to the other one, uh, the next part, where this is all means as well, that it is not, this all means as well, that it is not precisely individuals who occupy a given position in the given dominant hierarchy. Map schema themselves cooperate and compete within and between individuals. The intraphysics and social structure that results in is the consequence of that process. Thus, in a properly formulated dominance hierarchy, the presuppositions of the individuals match the structure of the group. This matching keeps the group stable and the individuals effectively regulated. Yeah, absolutely. Where was that at? Uh, uh, it's just uh, the okay, right there. last couple of sentences. Um, I don't see it. Um, this is all... Yeah, regulated is what... Right, unless to the ah, end of it. Uh, this keeps the group... Oh, okay, and there's... Okay. So any challenge to this match, and not simply to the intrapsychic or social structures themselves, therefore simultaneously dysregulates motivation and emotion. What is that? Oh, no. any challenge? Okay. Okay, so once you're, so what he's saying now is that the end uh, of the, the last section, he's saying that when you challenge what is known, basically disrupting this very deep set in system of, you know, hierarchy, et cetera, that is established from the outside. And this is this system from the outside that is, uh, you know, system of coordination. Mm -hmm. When that gets dysregulated, that also uh, dysregulates motivation and emotion in the individuals. So basically, screwing up the social dynamic, um, the and and uh, screwing with the, uh, the well, I, I hate I. I hate to call it the hierarchy, but the mm -hmm. organization, because it's not just a hierarchy. There's a lot of lateral uh, uh, associations and things like that that are important. Um, in any given group? Yes, absolutely. Because uh, when, you, when you're talking about, because what he's saying is there's an emergent. He's not using, this is an older paper, so he's not mm -hmm. using the term emergence as much as we do now. But it's a. Um, yeah, he, definitely before 2020. Right. So it's a, so basically what he's saying is there is an emergent. He's, he's also kind of talking about what is basically a selfish meme sort of uh, perspective you know you have Dawkins selfish gene well here he's, he's kind of looking at things from a selfish meme and that mm -hmm. is uh, uh, the ideas and the the way in which they end up organizing themselves by how they can play out and how can, how those those ideas like mechanics uh, end up working you know in each individual uh, they capture these the, the set of, uh, of ideas and, and behaviors etc mm -hmm. and then you know and then the whether or not they will work kind of is extruded into you know the the space of the that that an individual lives in other words it just they just kind of what fits is what sticks mm. and so that so there is this emergent effect mm. of the uh, of the ideas coming you know more kind of downward onto individuals from the group and 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 making you know a making an individual from the the a subset from the larger set of uh 
of uh, map schemas, which are you know your variously ideas. So it's a so there is kind of a selfish meme a little bit, but it's there. It's a little more um, complex than that, I suppose. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So so that's his last statement. Is just basically when uh, when you got this this known world that has all of its uh, associative um, relations all established, and everybody's working like a well-oiled machine. And then uh, that gets dysregulated, bam, everything's all fucked up. Uh, so that's, and that's where he starts the next section with the unknown, chaotic, unexplored, indeterminate world. All right. Okay, motivation, action, perception. Ah. Motivation, action, perception. Okay. Gotcha. So, goal, what do you do to get that goal, and what it is you, I guess, perceive to help you achieve that goal? Yeah. If okay. I'm understanding correctly. Sure. All right. Uh, so, so, oh, actually. Uh, that was the heading of that. The known, orderly, explored, determinate world. Oh, and there we now go. now we're going to the All right, so unexplored, that's a, indeterminate world. So that's the, the known. Oh, nice. I didn't realize that. So, so what she's seeing is that there's an earlier heading, double heading, like this double right, heading. Right, right. Where it starts, starts out with the known, orderly, explored, determinate world, and then this. Colon. Thing. Um, uh, actually, I can show it to you. Here. Motivation, action, perception thing. So, uh, yeah. yeah, schemas and their hierarchies. And then now we're at, that was page four. Yep, no. And on page 10, um, we're back at the unknown, chaotic, unexplored, indeterminate world. Yes. <laughs> Novelty, anomaly, and math schema disruption. Uh-oh. All right. The frame consisting of a point A and point B can well be considered a theory-laden map schema. What does that mean? What does that fuck <laughs> Theory-laden? Yes. Well, uh... Um, well, me there's well you you have once these different ideas of the world that you basically do have theories about the world that are imprinted upon you from childhood mm, uh, i see so they're all the assumptions right all your assumptions such a schema is also a story however in its simplest form analogous to the necessary fiction of Weinger and adler oh i meant to look all those things up and forgot Weinger. that i was supposed to Weinger. There was all of those four different things, the whatever, yeah. the hanger, the thing of Adler, yeah. the two other things. I all failed right. you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, the life space field of Lewin, the the scene of the phenomenologists. Yeah, well, that's bullshit. And the normal science of Kuhn. Okay, I know one of these. Normal science, uh, there's uh, uh, the, in the Kuhn cycle of uh, uh, scientific um, revolution, normal science is the plotting you know, kind of automatic develop. It's like basically it's the evo when I talk about evolutionary, shit, nothing below this point. No, okay, good, good. Because the uh, all of that is very familiar. The P once again. Yeah, it's no, we read we, we, we read, read, read the first paragraph to yes, see what we're right. preparing for. Okay. So, so uh, as I was saying, the uh, the Kuhn cycle is uh, is made up of basically there's these punctuated you know points of evolution that are uh, i'm using an old term here i don't know if i should but uh, some punctuated evolution is like an old thing but anyway um the there, there's these points at which revolution occurs because uh the once you have established a new paradigm in science you you things start just sort of falling out of the model. In other words, it, it automatically, by just looking closely at it and sort of mashing it together, it's just like evolution. Evolution continues without any understanding, without any thought, without any consideration or planning. Evolution creates useful systems. And those useful systems fall out of evolution because there's just things banging together and what will fit, fits. What sticks, yeah. <laughs> it's what will fit is what will stick. Right, exactly, and so there's this evolutionary development of complex systems in evolution, but uh, then that is normal science, mm -hmm. uh, according to Kuhn. And then, sure. but then eventually the the it, it, that sort of hits a brick wall. Well, it didn't. It doesn't hit a brick wall. It just slows to a point at which it starts to no you have model crisis, is what it's called. Yeah, and, and so it no longer can really because the the previous. Um, there's just there's sort of a disconnect between the how much the world changes, uh, you know, if we're talking about evolution, because I'm I'm trying to keep the analogy alive right. here. And if you talk about evolution, there's there's a disconnect between how much the world changes and how quickly animals change, right. and it, you know it, it can be slower or faster or you know whatever. And so th what ha what ends up happening is as something continues to develop from this basis of the new paradigm then you know eventually there's going to end up being so much of a mismatch that a huge number of the animals etc are going to not necessarily they're, they're going to become obsolete in one way or another in other words they won't have uh they will have diverged from reality they the they because that's kind of what a, a system is is it's sort of like a model 
of reality. It, tri it, it tries to, in analog, do the things that fit in the reality that it's in. And so there was all these situations. So, so animals, et cetera, are kind of an analog of their environment in a certain way. They're a concentrated version of their, their you know, their um, situation. And, uh, but eventually the, 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 the representative, I, okay, I'm getting too far into semiotics. Never <laughs> mind. Um, the, um, <laughs> but the, the point here, I suppose, uh, that I'm trying to get at, what is my point? Um, We're talking about generally describing the scientific. If I, if I just go, yeah, if I just go back to Kuhn, the 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 idea that he's trying to say here, the normal science is that there is a there's a base system that we rely upon. There's somebody yelling outside. That's weird. All right. <laughs> <laughs> they are. And uh, and so and that is what he's saying is here. So at least I know what one of those things are that he's saying. They're all basically similar. Uh, in in their uh, in their various forms, so he's he is bringing a lot of things together, and so I was hoping to s sort of do some of that without knowing what each one of those other things were. All right, so an, a map schema is also a cybernetic unit. See Wiener, uh, 1948. So that's the oh, remember I was saying cybernetics is about control. Um, it's yeah. yeah, in other words, it's not cyborgs. It's cy oh oh uh, yeah, because you're cybernetic. Yeah, a map schema is also a cybernetic unit. No, this needs to be. Cybernetic, and it's not about cybernetics. Okay. For our, our audience and myself. Oh, oh, say more about what I did before. Yeah. No, that's that's basically it. It's just it's, it's about uh, uh, I don't know cybernetics well enough to to explicate it beyond the 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 idea that it's just uh, cybernetics is how you control groups, oh. uh, and so there it's systems of controlling groups because th these things emerge naturally. In other words, people see control as something. Uh, uh, sort of sinister and yeah. intentional but that's not necessarily uh what is being talked about it's talking about there are systems that sometimes arise we control ourselves i mean just you know three people get together and they decide to go you know to to the store or to the movie or to whatever and they, they work out some sort of system that all three of them conform to and so that is a system of control. And so there are, you know, these these things that uh, are systems of control that aren't necessarily that sort of top down thing. They're just systems of controlling groups and organizing groups. Well, you can make an argument that just having a dominance hierarchy is in itself a form of oh, uh, a well, system of control. But that's the one that people see negatively. And so I was oh. trying to show more of the but um, emerging. Kind. I guess I, I'm coming at it from the perspective of lobsters organize themselves into dominance <laughs> hierarchies. Like it is such a basic uh, part of nature that we. Self-organize. Right. Self-control. Here's the thing. Whenever we're talking about the positive values and things like that of dominance hierarchies, and, and so that we have to be able to talk in terms that are palatable to people who dislike those things uh, and so that they understand the value of them. Because mm -hmm. there are people who – you, you don't need to preach to the choir. There are people who – um, are uh, who are all for dominance hierarchies. A lot of times, it may way way too much for them because they don't understand the problems with them right. very well. And so it's. Uh, but at the same time, the, the instead yeah, of I guess preaching, which, which side are we talking to? Right. <laughs> but you know, when you're talking about the positive of something, you mm -hmm. need to be able to, you know, uh, it, if you're talking to people, you want to convince that there is something positive there. And I feel like there is a our, our society has has come to the conclusion that any kind of hierarchy etc is it, uh, should be destroyed in mm -hmm. one way or another that's kind of our culture in the US and so that's why right. I'm sort of you know talking about the positives and you know remaining within positive terminology for a hierarchy uh, you know to kind of bring that out so uh, which is sort of what you know this paper is about is about uh, you know organization of groups and the value of organization of groups mm -hmm. Um, and how those things go can go terribly wrong when you don't have any kind of organization at all. All right, so uh, basically when you have chaos. Um, all right. So uh, a map schema is also a cybernetic unit. A, a broad interdisciplinary uh, consensus has emerged around the cybernetic framework based on the assumption that goal-directed, self-regulated systems constantly compare what is to what should be while attempting to reduce mismatch. Piaget adopted many cybernetic preconceptions, including the belief that all knowledge is tied to action on the most uh, elementary sensorimotor level and all the way up to the highest logical mathematical operations. Hmm. All knowledge is tied to action. 
Uh, I suppose that is sort of true. There's no, um, I mean, it's eventually tied to action, but that's, you know, connecting it that far, it, everything in the world is connected in one way or another like that. Uh, that you know, you, if you allow enough, uh, you know, intermediary steps, literally everything is connected to everything. Uh, so I, I, I don't know how much I uh, agree with that. So all knowledge is tied to action. Yes, it is. I think it's important to know that there's no reason to have knowledge unless it is useful for some goal. Um, you know, and so I, I would state it more generally like that, that there is that, that there is a uh, the reason why we capture and store knowledge is entirely for the purpose of well, it's for the purpose of, of understanding the future and for guessing at the future. And that's the maxima essentially is right. the why maxima exists. Motivation, right. action, uh, um, right. It seems like perception. It's, it's difficult to understand that it's a relationship between the two. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what Piaget was saying, mm -hmm. and they're saying that this is Piaget's, um, you know, uh, statement is that all knowledge is tied to action, and, and on the most elementary sensory motor level, all the way up to the highest logical ma mathematical operations. And I guess it, yeah, it is important to note that there is a. Um, uh, that that connection does go to very deep systems that are just like, you know, the connections of our muscles to, you know, to doing the walking thing on a treadmill. You know, there is, you can track it from that deepest level, uh, you know, how it developed. But I think that there is a level of complexity riding on top of those, those um, m more simple systems that, uh, that we discussed earlier. Because all those simple systems we discussed uh, earlier were the lower brain, the, you know, uh, hypothalamus and below, and where whereas we have this uh, thalamus and above uh, part of the brain that is that is much more complex than that, and we, re we you know he didn't really get into the um, thalamus and above. He stayed with hypothalamus and below. Right, but if we do keep going above, um, you know that higher and higher, I definitely does lend um, credence to something that we've talked about a couple of shows ago, where um, in fact um, something that led eventually. Um, was our mind then show about um, the elephant in the brain? Why we lie to ourselves? Why do we? Uh, why are we unrealistic about our own goals? Uh, why is it that we, you know, do things and then uh, that may be savory or unsavory or whatever, and then our mind kind of makes up a nice sounding reason why we right. did it. Right. Why your brain is primarily an excuse generator. Yeah. Right. Because the, these map schemas are working underneath right and without on a very primitive level on such a primitive level you're not aware of it right right yeah. uh absolutely so it's just a nice tie to to uh, things like that and also of course try to make sense of the world with our map schemas uh when things don't make sense we try to make sense of them yeah uh, as well and, and it is important to, to see that there is a lot of this stuff is happening you know, way underneath our perception level and our, you know, the, the, all these things are at a base. Well, and not just that, oriented. all this all this stuff is, you know, the, the most base system of all the various animals. You know, so when you're talking about uh, this, is, this is how intelligence itself, you know, developed. And so that, you know, when we're talking about the development of AI, et cetera, then, you know, those are important um, things to note mm -hmm. that this, these are, these base systems um, you know, rise, yeah. Are, 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 yeah, that is, that is the basis of in intelligence. And then it's just, but, you know, then looking at where it goes from those more basic systems, what I'm saying is, is kind of important and that they don't necessarily, he's not necessarily getting into yet. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, so knowledge, definitely knowledge is tied to action. I would say yes, but kind of dis more, more distantly than they're bringing out here and they're because they're talking about how knowledge is very directly tied to action which i think is oversimplifying it a bit or, or at least it leads to oversimplification if you don't say yeah at that level and there's a whole bunch more beyond that um all right Gloria sokolov and vin vinogradova Vinagrada. Vinagrada is um, grapes. Oh, yeah, sure. All right. Uh, we're also heavily instant, uh, influenced by Wiener. I don't know if it's Wiener or Weiner, but uh, I'm going to call him Wiener. Saying uh, Sokolov and Vinagradova were influenced by Wiener? Yeah. Because Sokol is a uh, hawk, and Vinagrada is in grapes. <laughs> These people have All very right. colorful last names. 
All four served as precursors to Gray, Miller, Galanter, and Pribram. Oh! <laughs> yep, and Pribram. Pribram's my boy. Yeah, he is. Uh, all right. <laughs> by extension, uh, my boy, too. <laughs> and, and used uh, cybernetic principles, uh, as did Powers and Shank and Abelson. Man, it's a whole lot of name naming. Man, he's like oh. doing the naming of names here. But he's doing another one of those things where the, this paragraph is just full of. Yeah, this is just a way to to, to uh, He had a he he needed to include a shit ton of references. You know, he has to, five pages of references. Right. So he just like okay, let me make a let me take my references and make a uh, a beginning statement out of them. Uh, <laughs> similar ideas have emerged with regards to emotions and their role. In giving value to objects of apprehension and indicating the interruption of gold. All right, great. What are similar ideas? What are these similar ideas? Uh, to ideas that uh, it's similar to Piaget's. The consensus uh, uh, around the cybernetic framework, right. uh, based on the assumption that goal oriented self regulatory systems constantly compare what is to what should be while attempting to be. Right. Cool. I'd agree with that too. <laughs> All right. Seems reasonable. Gloria Sokolov uh, Vinogradova Vinogradova. Uh, Vinogradova, uh, and Gray hypothesized specifically that complex organisms uh, developed a complete internal model of the world and how it should unfold as a consequence of current actions and continuously contrasted this internal model with expectation with what was, in fact, occurring. Oh my God, that exactly matches what I've been telling people that there's a... Uh, that the way in which we're going to uh, make advances in AI is through using what the analog of what we've learned through uh, double exposure holographic interferometry. And that is a comparison of two different models. In, mm -hmm. in other words, you can take a hologram and then uh, expose the object that you've taken a hologram of and uh, to some sort of stresses, et cetera, and the tiniest tiniest mm -hmm. changes in it once you uh, once you take another hologram of it exposing it on top of the first will show cause a uh, will show very small differences in, in a very and is that a method of learning is that what you're saying or? i'm saying that 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 is an analogy for how it is that we're uh, going to be advancing ai i mean it's um this is it, okay so now this goes back to pribram and uh uh oh, I'm bring it up. right and so understanding we should, we should that definitely have a show about that Right, that the, the way in which you store information is holographic. That's why it's it kind of non-local. That's why one memory isn't in one place like right. it is with current digital technology. And they had people uh, get poked in uh, in different areas of the because the, your your brain doesn't feel pain once the skull's been opened up and your brain's exposed. It doesn't actually feel pain. Uh, so they 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 were poking people uh, with electrodes in certain areas of the brain, and they would like, oh, it smells like autumn leaves. Oh, this reminds me of my grandma's, you know, this. Yeah. So just all over the brain, there's all of these bits and pieces. Yeah, well, no, but the way that you're rep representing that is exactly the opposite of what I was saying, though. Uh, and what would happen in that well, specific it's, it's not instance? Localized. It's like all over the place. Like yeah, was, but you, if you poke in one place, why does that result in one particular memory? Because uh, it's not a memory; it's just it's like a, a, only a smell or only a color. Or it, it, maybe I didn't. Uh, even that uh, theoretically is not uh, is not stored. Uh, it's, it's too localization gotcha. of of a particular memory. But what happens is localized events can guide uh, how a hologram, you know, or the, how the a holographic picture unfolds. In other words, it, right. In other words, there once you light up certain areas, there's going to be an interference pattern occurring mm. from. Okay, uh, first of all, let me let me just sort of back up and say that I come from a perspective of believing that fields. In the brain are a, a absolutely crucial part of cognition and fields in other words there's a what, so. no no when you when a when electricity fires down a wire there is a oh a, a, a electro electromagnetic field right there's a there is a um, according to the right hand rule there is a magnetic mm -hmm. field around the the, uh, the that spins in a particular direction right and so that so what I'm talking direction. about is that when you have coordinated firing of neurons there is then the mix of those fields we'll say that results in in changes to the electromagnetic potential in various areas that then modulates the likelihood of action potentials in other words how, modulates how likely it is a given not, neuron will, will fire that is not those neurons but the neurons in between 
In other around. words, like say you have three neurons placed an inch away from each other, the neurons in between those th those three uh, will actually be affected by the firing of the others. Now that's a gigantic dis distance th that I was only giving for the, uh, you know, for the sake of discussion. But the point is that there are various things like that that uh, that culminate in uh, firing. So so that is p part of how Bowman Pribram's model uh, works, and that is not. Uh, very widely accepted yet. There's a, a lot of controversy on whether or not fields are um, are part of uh, the way that the brain works, and there is a lot of people who are like, "Well, we don't need this crosstalk communication, etc., in the in you know modern neural networks." So, uh, you know, that's that's ridiculous. However, that is a um, we don't have the same power in our current neural networks that we do in a brain, and there is a um, it's kind of a it's it's a simplified view of things because the the way the neural ne networks end up storing information actually is holographic and people who work on neural networks don't know that because it is it's not intentional they're not intentionally creating holograms they're copying a system that the brain work uh, uses and so the uh, so there is an um, it is not explicitly stored. In other words, the connections between the, what they do is they're, they're end, ending up storing probability densities in various variables, but the relationships of those numbers that are stored are themselves also information. Yeah. And that is the part that even people who are working on neural networks usually, or very frequently are not aware of. They're not aware that it actually creates a holographic- um, A meta sort of. Right, exactly. There is another level of information storage that is not explicit to the what is stored in those variables, but the relationships between oh, the them, the relation, relationships between all of those variables, is additional information, okay. and that's part of how uh, neural networks work that a lot of people don't know. So, so going back to all of that, so I, I I'm always coming from a perspective of believing the brain brain works through uh, holographic computation. Mm -hmm. And that is a non-standard, uh, but it's it's a known. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not coming up with it myself. It comes from Bowman Pribram, and there are other people who you know. Are, are and working. that's pretty old research. I mean. Oh God, yes. Uh, so, but it's just a lot of people. Okay, Perhaps. Bowman Pribram couldn't explain how holography worked in the in the brain very well in 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 a way that people could grok. That's the problem. Is they they couldn't people couldn't get what they were saying. They they. They compared it to like Fourier. I said it was a while ago. So. The, yeah, <laughs> right. They well, they compared it to Fourier transforms, and oh, Fourier transforms awesome. basically are when you take a bunch of different waves that are all, you know, superposed on each other. They're interfering, and then you can pull them apart and find the individual waves from them. Mm -hmm. And there, whenever you're dealing with holography, there is something sort of like that, but that is a that is a linear, you know, digital kind of you know. You're only getting one layer of information. Well, yeah, and, really. and you're exactly, and it's a very stepwise, linear sort of way of looking at something that is much more concurrent. It's much more massively parallel than that, and so calling it a uh, Fourier transform is a real like hyper simplification to the point that it makes it, it, it you you lose what is actually going on in a holographic computation. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so just you know, let's let's go move forward from that. You know um, that understanding of where I'm coming from. Um, okay. So there is a um, the, the contrasting the internal model with what is in fact occurring is what is going on here. Uh, when things go yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, I just noticed uh, a comment in chat uh, which I found uh, compelling enough to interrupt you. <laughs> okay. Um, the idea of what you just described as the sort of the, the second order of information, um, would that be in any way related to why they might have deja vu? Um, the, the, the interference patterns activating? Something that's already there. I think right. deja vu has to do with that, that um, there's white space. Okay, there, whenever you have experiences, whenever you have, whenever you draw a picture that is a very complex picture of reality, um, there is a white space where, where it uh, only takes tiny little pieces of information to fill in and create another picture. And I think that it might be more related to that. In other words, when you, you, um, 
uh, right now is when I usually require a visual aid in that, and that uh, Morgan Theomachia uh, alchemy uh, poster. I guess, oh. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Put alchemy. There you go. There it is down there. I know Bring the poster. I was just going to look up, but I didn't know there was yeah, more Just show more that on screen real quick. Yeah. yeah, I just usually Google. Yeah, show that on screen. Uh, so the thing is, if you if you look at this poster, it only takes a tiny, tiny little bit of um, uh, additional information to connect those things, and then a, a picture of dragons also becomes a picture of a face. And so in your brain, when you have all of the, this information that's stacked on top of it, it, itself, in other words, they, I believe that this is one of the best examples of how uh, holography we works based on the uh, on similarity of information. In other words, we actually, not only is it stored uh, as a hologram, there is a similarity between information that is kind of a, a requirement for how we store information and associate it. Uh, that uh, that is, is, that we kind of see in this poster, and that is that there's just a tiny, tiny little change here or there. Like if you just connect with their mouths and connect their knees or whatever, or and, if they're, yeah, they're all, and yeah, then it's tiny. then it's a face. But the thing is, when we are uh, going through life, we may only just have experience with the dragons, and that's our only experience. But then suddenly we see the face. You know, in, a, in other words, in our own mind, we see the white space, the additional picture that is there, and it feels like it's always been there because it kind of has always been there. Uh, and so I think that that may be responsible for a lot of the uh, deja vu sort of stuff. There is, there is a tremendous amount of information that when you have accurate representations of reality in your mind, when, it, when your brain has a, a level of accuracy, then what you know creates things that you don't know and they are mm -hmm. also accurate because of the if you've properly associated reality those that white space will also create a, a correct picture and so the so that's why you can uh that's part of the creative process and how it is that we discover new things about reality and th uh, that are true through just just very slight things the, just the tiniest little you know look at the same information and bam you now know something new about reality because you've properly associated your information and that proper association has to do with you know uh, basically matching not just the hierarchy but the lateral associations of the various systems you know going on in physical reality I I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll worry about that later. <laughs> we used to have this poster, um, which is actually, uh, I, I bought it at a, at a college poster sale. And uh, when I first unrolled it for you, you didn't really react. And I was like, that is such a badass poster. It's got dragons and the lady. I, I'm so surprised you didn't. You were thinking that and did not say that. I was that. thinking that in my and head. She, and she showed it to me, uh, like unrolling just a small part of it. So I started with. Just the middle part. Just the middle. So she started with very with it being very close to my face, unrolling it uh, you know, slowly, where the only thing I could see was the dragon. So the way she presented it to me made it uh, where it was uh, nearly impossible to immediately recognize the face until it was completely unrolled and uh, at a greater distance. And suddenly it's like, oh my God, there's a face there. So that was a, that was a great experience by itself. And the funny thing is she didn't uh, know that uh, the reason why I wasn't recognizing it. Yeah. And then when you looked at it, you were like, oh, I love this. Yeah. <laughs> And since then, you've been using it. Uh, oh yeah, use it all the time. Metaphors all the time. <laughs> yeah, because it's it's fantastic. Um, all right. So, when something expected, when something unexpected occurs, by contrast, the orienting reflex, a sequence of rapid preparatory responses, manifests itself. Current goal-directed actions cease. When mismatch between desire and world emerges, detected by the Septal hippocampal comparator systems. Oof, that's a mouthful. Yeah. A lower brain circuit function, including the amygdalic, is disinhibited, activating circuitry in the right hemisphere. And later, in the processing chain, inhibiting the frontal and prefrontal systems of the left cortical hemisphere with associated uh, uh, hemisphere associated with positive emotion. Left cortical hemisphere is associated with positive emotion? That's cool. Yeah, I think whenever you're you're uh, remember when we were looking at um, 
the dominance of brain activation uh, when you're talking about uh, when, when you put sensors on your head. What is it? Brainwave. Mm -hmm. uh, when, yeah. yeah. No, well, not just in training, though. The, uh, Neurofeedback? Nope. Using uh, brain waves as a, um, a method of, of looking at what's going on in the brain. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what that's even fucking um, called. I don't either. <laughs> um, but anyway, the, the uh, whenever there was a dominance of, of activation, especially of uh, of alpha waves mm -hmm. in the left uh, hemisphere, then you, that, that was a, usually associated with a uh, a more stable mental state. Whereas when they are uh, when they are dominant in the right hemisphere, that was associated with a more depressive uh, sort of state. And so that's that goes right along with what they're saying here is that when something unexpected occurs, by contrast, the orienting reflex a sequence of rapid preparatory responses manifests itself. Current goal-directed actions cease. So basically now, basically that, that means that your brain has detected that the situation has changed and you can no longer use your current systems to interact with reality. When mismatch between desire and world emerges, detected by the septal hippocampal comparator system. So that's, in other words, current, current goal-directed actions cease. So you can't, you no longer, you lose goals because you, you're now working in a different system. So your brain well, that detects like depression. that. <laughs> exactly. Uh, lower brain uh, circuit function, including the amygdalic, is disinhibited, uh, activating circuitry in the right hemisphere. So apparently your right hemisphere, you can see, is, is what then becomes lit up and attempting to, you know, Fix the right, this, this, mismatch between. this mismatch between your model of the world and the actual world you're experiencing. Uh, and later in the processing chain, inhibiting the frontal and prefrontal systems of the left cortical hemisphere. So uh, there's actually an inhibition of frontal and prefrontal systems. Um, no, it seems like you become more animalistic. The prefrontal cortex is executive function, uh, delayed gratification, things like that. Well, hold on a second. Lower brain circuit disinhibit. Uh, and later in the processing chain, inhibiting the frontal and prefrontal system. Yeah, so basically uh, things become unpleasant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, the autonomic nervous system is engaged. Uh, heart rate rises in prepara preparation for non-specific uh, action, and cortisol floods the bloodstream. Startle responses sounds like a stress response. Yes, it does. <laughs> Startle responses, primitive but fast, governed by brainstem circuitry, produce virtually instantaneous physiological defensive postures designed to protect the body, particularly the head and neck. This is followed. Sounds by like bad posture. <laughs> this is followed by activation of circuits in the superior colloculus, colloculus. Okay. which uh, direct uh, the sensory system of the head towards the environmental locale that quick and dirty systems have specified as the source of the anomaly. Quick and dirty. Yeah. Oh, it makes sense that you'd, have, you'd have very quick and dirty sort of systems that, are, that, that would be necessary to the... Approximations, stress, approximations uh, I mean, are crucial in, in saving on processing time. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, analog computation is becoming the, that is this, this decade's, you know, uh, and I've been s screaming it from the rooftops for, you know, half a decade at least, uh, yeah. <laughs> that uh, the analog Five processing will be years. what, you know, the, the revolution. Now people are listening. Um, but anyway, yeah. Uh, Eventually they all listen. Yep, that's true. Uh, hypothalamic systems refer to, all right. Uh, hypothalamic systems, uh, particularly those in the rostral segment, uh, ready fight or flight, another aspect of defensive response. Uh, in contact, in concert with the pain sensitive systems of the periaqueductal uh, That's been a while since I've heard that word. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, the extended amygdala, the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, uh, enhances vigilance and provisionally associates the anomalous occurrence with anomalies that have in the past produced negative outcomes. This comparator theory, advanced uh, most completely by Gray, has become exceedingly influential across wide domains of psychological inquiry. And I would assume that what, the, what they're talking about here is that, the, that there is, there, would be, there can be, they're talking about an extreme activation of a system, whereas I would uh, assume there's also low level activations of that same system that can occur over long periods of time and that uh, ends up being a very negative overall state mm -hmm. and leads to ne negative <laughs> overall outcomes right I, there was something there actually that that was really i wanted to think of the terminology finally the extended amygdala enhances vigilance and provisionally associate there it is 
provisionally associates the anomalous occurrence with anomalies that in the past have produced negative outcomes. Paranoia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Basically. It's, not, it's new, and therefore it's bad. It, it, it's um, new. I'm feeling weird. Oh, it's going to turn out bad. I just know it. Yeah, yeah. I just know it. Yeah, somehow I just know it. Somehow. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, it remains predicated, nonetheless, on four assumptions about perception that can no longer be maintained. Uh, thus, the role of hierarchical uh, arrangement of map schema plays in, uh, in affect regulation that it has... Thus, the role the hierarchical arrangement of map schema plays in affect regulation has not yet been fully appreciated. What's he saying here? I so, the, on four assumptions. Let's see, it remains predicated, nonetheless, on four assumptions about perception that can no longer be maintained. So, he's saying, what is, okay, comparator theory is predicated on assumptions that can no longer be maintained. Well, I wish I understood what four he's talking about. Um, oh, that's the role of hierarchical arrangement of map schema plays in a, in affect. On four assumptions. Regulation. Of What's affect mean again? I it's it's a psychological term that is different than the normal. Psychology. psychology affect and psychology describe experience of feeling or emotion okay so it's the experience the word of affect is a noun being so uh in psychology affect mediates an organism's interaction with i, I prefer you pronounce it affect because affect. It, it that the word sense. also refers sometimes to affect display which is a facial vocal or gestural behavior that serves as an of affect right so affect regulation so the role that hierarchical arrange hierarchical arrangement of map schema plays in affect regulation has not been fully appreciated yeah I'm not sure what why he's making this statement it doesn't really follow very well for me because um, we so okay the follow in the following might have to do something with Gray's theory about the four assumptions about perception. Okay, what is Gray's theory? Gray, Gray has, a, has four? Oh, no, it just says this comparator oh, okay. theory advanced most completely by Gray has become so... Uh, okay, because he's sitting there talking about all of these various things that occur whenever you're associating, and, and uh, they're talking about startle response. They're basing all of this on startle response, right. which I think is kind of a simplified case. Um, you know, startle response is going to be different than other things, but... Uh, but I could see how perhaps startle response is a model, a, a simplified model of other responses to, you know, new stimuli, and uh, and they're trying to extend it as far as possible in the theory. Um, but that is comparator theory. I think also was how things should be. In other words, the comparator you, you go back to earlier here in the statement. They're saying that uh, there is this uh, the model that you have of how reality should be and then you're comparing that to you know you, you have a, you have a model of reality and you're comparing that to what's actually happening and so once that goes awry there's this you know things like startle response especially if there's a you know very significant change and but yeah i can't find anything specific then how does this there. last sentence fit there it really doesn't very well now, and maybe he'll get to it so yeah. let's just go go forward yeah i couldn't really find much about gray other than that he's a psychologist who wrote psychology books and believed in self-directed education for children and wanted them to play more without adult supervision. So maybe he'll get to, the, to what he means by this, this last sentence a little further forward. All right, Sokolov's uh, subjects responded with an orienting reflex to the tiniest alterations in lab stimuli. He used auditory tones and elicited a galvanic skin response to any alteration in volume, tempo, or irregularity in tone, onset or offset. That's fucking cool. Wait, I don't understand what? Uh, he was able to, Sokolov is somebody who did some, some right. experiments and he was able to get galvanic a, skin response. a change oh. in galvanic skin response from any changes such as volume, tempo, or irregularity in tone, onset, or offset. So in other words, he, anytime there was a change in the reality that they were perceiving at all whatsoever, they got okay. a galvanic skin response off Which of that. Which is like what, uh, conductivity, heat, yeah. moisture, all those. 
Okay. Um, well, you can read what what galvanic skin responses remind us uh, all the. Yeah. Do Two. that. Extra drama activity. Electrodermal activity is the property of the human body that causes continuous variations in the electrical characteristics of the skin. Skin conducting conductance, galvanic skin response, all these other words for it. The traditional theory of EDA holds that skin resistance varies with the state of sweat glands in the skin. Sweating is controlled by the sympathetic nervous system, and skin conductance is an indication of psychological or physiological arousal. If the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system is highly aroused, the sweat glands activity also increases, which in turn increases skin conductance. In this way, skin conductance can be a measure of emotional and sympathetic responses. More recent research uh, and added phenomena of resistance, potential, impedance, and admittance, sometimes responsive and sometimes apparently spontaneous, suggest that EDA, uh, electrodermal activity, is more complex than it seems, and research continues into the source and significance of EDA. Interesting. Okay, so basically your skin is very responsive to um, your mental state. Um, all right. It was this sensitivity that produced LSVG's first error. That was whoever, Sokolov, Vinogradova, and Berezov. Okay. The hypothesis of complete objective modeling. Okay, so the idea that we completely model the, the world he's saying is one of the first errors. Later researchers demonstrated that orienting only occurs toward differences that make a difference. Uh, anomalies that interfere actively with current goal, directed activity, and not, to, uh, and not to all stimulus change. Modeling is thus far, uh, modeling is thus far from complete. Consciousness attends selectively to the minimum set of elements necessary to bring about the desired transformation. I think by transformation he means like the changes to the world that you are part of your goal. Uh, so LSVG assumed, secondly, that the CNS compared incoming objective sensory data and expectation. So that's in incoming sensory data, reality, and expectation construed cognitively. Uh, so as behaviorists, they presumed that stimuli were objectively real and simply given, and, the, and they gave short shrift to motivation. Yes. Behaviorists. Right, yeah, behaviors. Oh my God. Bless them, but also no. But also no. They, we, we needed them when, when we were well, first. We needed them, but yeah, no. when we were first making our first tentative steps, but uh, yeah. No, it's, sorry. We're, we're, we're beyond that now. Uh, living creatures do not so much expect things, however, as desire them. Desire is motivation, and it is motivational systems that fundamentally give rise to map schema, or LSVG mismatchment error, cognitive error, error meant anxiety, and anxiety indicated that behavior had to be retooled. Mismatch, however, is, due, is much more than a problem of erroneous action, but this cannot be understood uh, without due consideration of motivation. If the desired future fails to appear, it is not only current actions that might be wrong, current desire might be wrong as well. Perhaps the erroneous map schema, schema is based in jealousy, for instance, and the situation is such that jealousy merely makes things worse. So um, this is this is basically he's saying that uh, <laughs> what we're watching is the evolution of our uh, neuroscience from very simplistic uh, yeah. things to no, I, I love it. That's why it's the it, it is the introductory. It's the first thing you read when you crack open Psychology of Meaning book because he gives you essentially Good. a quick. Now I kind of I might want to read the whole book. Read the whole book, point, right? Because if he goes from here forward well, and tries, I, I saw the people. It, it's, oh, too bad. This is the only thing that Jordan Peterson did with that book. Everything else is other people's. Oh, well, because I would have liked to have seen a long explication of his paper from him because there's certain points where here where he's really he's taking as many shortcuts as possible because right. he's, he's delivering the the history and mm -hmm. and necessity of an entire field of research. Right. Exactly. And so that's something that in this short form, as long as it's been with us, it's still short form. Mm -hmm. um, all right. And, uh, and I don't know that I could fully agree with what even what they're what he's saying right now, but uh, it's at least it's a it's a development in the right direction. So okay, um, gave short shrift to motivation, and that uh, anxiety indicated the behavior had to be retooled. Mismatch, however, is much more than a pro than the problem of erroneous action. 
but this cannot be understood without due consideration of motivation. Future fails to appear is not only uh, current actions that might be wrong. Current desire might be wrong as well. Okay. And that's something that behavior is never considered. That right. The, the motivation as far right. as... How does it... It's basically self-referential detection. In other words, mm -hmm. the system has to detect errors in the system. It has to be self-referential, otherwise it can't really develop very well. Right. Um, okay. So, thirdly, it is not reality that is compared with expectation, not desire. Um, the expectation they're saying is they don't really expect things, they just want things. Right. <laughs> and it, therefore it's the same. Yeah, I don't, I don't really uh, believe that that's a, well, an accurate way of putting it. What intelligence but, are we talking about? Yeah, though, you know? uh, I mean, I, I, I see what he's saying because I do, that's one of the things I, I've actually was talking about just in the past couple of months is how, you know, things can't really move forward. In other words, you're not, you're a machine without desire. Uh, and, uh, and desire is necessity for, is, is necessary for intellect. It was something I recognized, you know, decades ago. But it's a, uh, you know, desire it has to is be managed if possible, right? In the most adaptive way possible, right? But we, without, when we, if you completely eliminate desire, you basically eliminate, you know, motivation. If you eliminate motivation, then you eliminate life. Uh, you know, so there is the desire is something at the very basis of, uh, of life. So, um, yeah, I, I would say that that's true even without a brain. Truthfully, yeah. Uh, you know, I think there is a desire for, um, you know, th that leads to motivation in single-celled organisms. Uh, it's just it's not represented by, you know, nerves and things like that. It's represented by Chemical the... Chemical signals. Well, it's, it's represented by the very configuration of the organism at, at a certain point. The mm -hmm. very configuration of the, or of the organism is data, and that data has written within it a uh, certain desires because that is what is necessary to achieve the goal of living. Um, all right. Yeah, thirdly, is not reality that is compared with expectation, but desire. Uh, that's what he's saying there. Uh, we are not privy to reality, even in the present. Current actuality is modeled uh, much as future possibility. Sometimes you cannot get from point A to point B because you're not actually at point A. Uh, we compare a motivated model of the present to a motivated model of the future. In the case of error, this means that, that the very way we perceive things, past, present, and future, might be incorrect. Failure to re failure uh, represents us uh, with the frame problem. This is a very serious problem indeed, given the multiple ways the complex world of things and situations can be perceived. Uh, whatever anxiety might arise at the failure of our actions is nothing compared with the terror of having to recalibrate our perceptions. LSVG were therefore not nearly pessimistic enough about error. Uh, when what is desired does not manifest itself, motivation and perception as well as cognition and action might all be incorrect anywhere in their structure. Now, that's a very important point. It's like the, the system has to be more capable of rewriting things from a very basic level, uh, you know, from a very basic, not completely basic, but a very basic level. This bring, brings us to the fourth and final element missing in the standard account, the implications of hierarchical map schema structure. In the absence of such nesting, it would be impossible to disinhibit motivation and emotion at different levels of intensity when anomalies of different significance emerge. All errors would be equally overwhelming or equally irrelevant. However, uh, varying errors indeed produce various reactions. Each mistake cannot be evaluated cognitively, however. Uh, there is insufficient time for that. Instead, potential meaning is bounded a priori by the breadth slash import of the current map schema. That is a very interesting set of statements there. So what he's saying is that... Um, and that is true. Yeah, there has to be some sort of establishment of the importance of error. There has mm -hmm. to be a, a gradient of how valuable or non-valuable is this new information. Right, because then, then everything's nothing, everything's everything. Right, yeah. exactly. You there have, has to be hierarchy. There has to be some sort of hierarchy of the importance of an, of an error. Back to hierarchies again, damn it. <laughs> yep. Um, <laughs> Almost like they're an integral part of reality. Whoa. Heretic. No, so <laughs> systems are terrible, but systems are necessary. <laughs> All right. 
Uh, but then also, let's see. Um, there's insufficient time for that. Instead, a potential meaning is bounded a priori by breadth import of the current map schema. Okay, so he's saying that the current map schema being used to evaluate the difference is uh, it determines what uh, how important the new stimuli is to, uh, in other words, how you categorize the importance deals with the current schema that is active. it's associated with. I mean, and the one that's act well, yeah, it both the current one that's active and therefore associated with. Mm -hmm. And so that's how that's how it's the, the, we determine importance. Basically, is what he's saying. Um, Large. Yep, large-scale map schemas are built from the bottom up, following Piaget and Swanson, established at spinal levels. Oh, wow. So what he's getting here is... is, is some the, Piaget is and the, Swanson, some basic child development. Well, shit. not just that. What I love here is looking at the way that bottom-up and top-down, because that's what's important. That's why people hate hierarchy so much, is because they always believe hierarchy... Even the, even the higher word is better. higher is better exactly up higher up, up is good up is good down is bad and people ha have this association with hierarchy that up is good down is bad and that is completely you know top down hierarchy is what people always think of hierarchy without mm -hmm. understanding that bottom, emergent bottom up it is yeah sometimes it is the is the dominant force and there's always a both a top down and bottom up in any complex system that is successful uh, over time so. Um, interesting. Uh, all right, so large-scale map schemas are built from the bottom up, following Piaget and Swanson, established at spinal levels. So I'm sorry, I have to break here for a moment because some of the things I've been t thinking about is how it is that you organize a govern, uh, how you organize governance. And just this morning, I was thinking about it's like, well, you know, perhaps two hours ago. Oh yeah. Oh, oh this morning when we were there. I morning, don't. Morning. I don't know. Earlier in my life. Uh, <laughs> on the order of hours uh, instead of days. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking about that, uh, you know, so I've been kind of thinking about the how you design a new system of organization of humanity in a, di right. in a, in a technological world. And, you know, and some of the ideas I had years ago were about, you know, basically allowing uh, the identification of projects to be, um, you know, there being all these various projects where we would spend money and then finding, uh, you know, and then basically allowing people to make decisions about how to organize which one is of more importance so that the, the will of the people when it comes to, you know, do we need to be working on roads? We'll do we need to be working on schools? Yeah. Do we need to be, in other words, having some way to input the way that in, instead of, it's so basically. Representation in a way? Right, exactly. <laughs> Re representation for how the money is spent, you know, uh, it, I think is a very important part. And that way people feel like, in other words, taxation feels like thievery to people who, who lose all control over right. the money. They have However, autonomy. But once, but if you can grant people control of the way that their tax money is spent, they do not necessarily feel like it is uh, as it, onerous. Yeah, it's it's not as onerous and it's not as stolen from them. Especially if remember how I, I talked about basically people who are able to contribute more should be honored more, Absolutely. so that they so that there's they, there's a yes. social people know. It's oh, okay to want to have recognition for being a philanthropist. Right. It's okay. Exactly, and and so therefore, if their their tax money was used to build bridges, then perhaps their name should be on the bridge, kind of right. thing. You yeah. Know. And so 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 things like that. Where live on in the cultural memory. Right. So in other words, so th so that their contribution, if it is larger in some way, at least is honored in some way. And so it's not just taking the money from them. And then it's then it's, you know, uh, anyway. So all that aside, the, my, my whole point is that developing importance from the bottom up, in other words, importance of task or goal, etc. Uh, you know, trying to use biomimicry and, and having and bottom up systems. And, and, and here he's actually identifying specifically that the map schemas built are built from the bottom up and that is establishing the priority of the importance of a given you know stimuli or change in stimuli and so there's actually an analogy here in the way that our brains work that's mm -hmm. that is um that's interesting so uh, large-scale map schemas are built from the bottom up following piaget and swanson established at spinal levels organized into more completely sequenced routines 
represented as abstractions, communicated and verbally organized into long-term plans. A large-scale plan thus consists of smaller plans, which consist of even smaller plans, mm -hmm. which eventually ground out in muscle movement itself, uh, where the mind meets the body. Development is simultaneous higher order organization of intrapsychic and social map schemas. Effective stability, particularly at higher order levels, is dependent upon a match between between them. To say it again, um, imagine an inverted neural hierarchy representing map schema import mismatch disruption of schemas closer to the point of the V are more upsetting. What? Inverted neural hierarchy. Oh, okay, I see. Uh, the meaning of a uh, so as a V shape is mm -hmm. what you mean by inver right. inverted. Okay. I think so. so yeah, the the ones that are closer to the bottom point are probably the worst. The most upsetting. Upsetting. Why aren't we talking about development of simultaneous effective ability, particularly at higher order levels, are dependent upon the match between. Let me, let me read the last line here. The meaning of a high-resolution schema depends on its role as a sub-element of a lower-resolution schema. Grades in a pre-med class only matter in the broader context of wanting to be a physician. So in other words, so what your do you goal... What by most upsetting at the bottom? Uh, I don't know. We're talking about bottom-up. Like okay, well, just... hold on. Yeah, I don't know what's the bottom and what's the top at that point. Uh, so... A large-scale plan thus consists of smaller plans, which is uh, uh, which are eventually ground out in muscle movement itself. Okay, so large-scale plans would be the top of the V, it seems like. Development uh, okay. is simultaneous higher-order organization of intrapsychic and social map schemas. Okay, so, so basically the stuff that you develop through muscle memory and all of those sorts of things uh, integrated with your uh, the social stuff is uh, you have that that's how, that's how you develop those those things is through both the higher and the lower order co coming together that's well, what he's trying to say i think one second he's saying that it's a uh, if we're talking about bottom up and he's talking about an i think he's talking about v, both does it mean i think what maybe what he's trying to say that uh the very bottom of the v is the most higher order processing and it's that's the most upsetting i don't think so oh. hold on um Affective stability. I just don't understand why. Affective we, stability. So emotional, you know, like uh, experience. I just don't understand why we need to do that. Why do we need to imagine? I don't know. Just v, hold on. Let's what? maybe continue forward. Sure. Affective stability, particularly at higher order levels, is dependent upon the match between them. Okay. Between the highest psychic. order, oh. highest order um, and organization, and lowest order is what he's saying. The match between them. So, so basically, the um, well, in that case, the V uh, point is the most overlapping. Therefore, there's the most match there. No? Effective stability, particularly at higher order levels, is dependent upon the match between them. Or is the visual overlap of the V lower? Imagine an inverted neural hierarchy. Fuck the neural hierarchy. Oh, representing map schema import. Yeah, the meaning of a high resolution schema depends on its role as a sub element of the lower resolution. Oh, okay, schema. okay, I see what he's. I think so. Uh, low resolution schemas where it will be. So he's saying that like be be a physician. That's a low resolution schema at the higher order, um, and uh, but then there's sub elements of that. Well, the, the I'm still uh, fixated on the most upsetting, and I think I understand what he's talking about at the bottom. That is where is your most basic assumption about life. And so when those are violated, that's the most upsetting because your whole understanding of how everything works, the very bottom of the foundation of the neural schema, the very base, the very beginning map mm -hmm. schema that you had, that everything was built on top of, when that is challenged, that would be most upsetting. Maybe, but I think he, he, he gives an example here at the end and saying that grades in a pre-med class only matter in the broader context of wanting to be a, posi a physician. So, But grades wouldn't be the basic. Of they? they wouldn't be yeah, at well, the... Go away, kitty, go. They wouldn't be at the bottom of the V, would they? Um, be at the top. Wanting to be a physician would be at the top. 
and the grades would be at the bottom uh, in this specific example, I think. And I think that that, that you have the most upset when you ha get bad grades, whereas because it happens more slowly, whether or not you're going to be a physician, that, that level of upset at any given time is, uh, is not as high. Because you know, you're you're paying more attention to well, the like individual consciously part. being upset so, rather so than your foundation being shaken. Maybe. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. I think I think that's we're just gonna have to leave it at that because yeah. it's it's not clear. Right. But he is talking about the importance of errors in the in, and so there is a hierarchy of errors. Well, in other words, like when things mismatch your expectation. Ah. Which are things that, that, that. mismatch your your desire. So mm -hmm. the context is right. things don't match. The world isn't the way you want it to be. And how do you organize the importance of the stimuli? And so the importance of the stimuli, you know, it, is it more important? And do you react more strongly to something at a very high level, or do you react more strongly to something at a lower level? And usually, you know, startle response things that are like there's somebody there with a knife. You know that that sort of thing is is going to be much more upsetting than you know you kind of recognizing cognitively that you may not be on the right path to a phys being a physician. Uh, you know that's not going to immediately cause some huge cortisol release necessarily, and you're not going to jump. You're not going to jump scare at re realizing you might not be at the uh, not, might not be accomplishing your large large scale goals. Uh, so what's the significance? And could you? Um Tie that together. I thought yeah. I just did. The oh, I uh, I just did. okay. So what I'm saying is that he says grades in a pre-med uh, class only matter in the con a broader context of wanting to be a, ph a physician. That kind of thing. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, and I, I could be having it exactly the opposite here, but well, I just like to hear that again. Set up. Okay. So he's. I, I'm not sure which part you're missing. Just, Sorry. Uh, Okay, hold on. I, I, I've got conflicting lines of thought going, and so I have wow. to untangle them. <laughs> uh, I, um, um, so it, just in a, you're not going to jump scare at at realizing that you might not be on the on the pro proper path to being a physician. Therefore, so it's the less the most so or? therefore it's it's not at your. I think you, there is a um, the importance or whatever that we put towards things and so that doesn't it doesn't really work the thing what i'm saying right now i think he may be saying but i don't agree with it which gotcha. is why i'm having a hard time saying it because i don't feel like it's true so, <laughs> <laughs> it's, so what is jordan possibly saying? that he could be possibly saying that or he could actually be saying the opposite as well he well, could be saying the opposite i still don't understand i thought he was saying that i just said it you you're not going to jump scare and what does that mean uh well, you know what a jump scare is, no. okay? Are you insulting me on purpose? <laughs> no, it's because it makes no sense what you're saying. So I just missed. Okay, so so he's saying the importance of the schemas. I think he's saying the importance of the schemas has to do with how physiologically reactive it is. So how is that different than me saying that the most upsetting thing would be that something that violates your assumption about reality, such as like an earthquake or everybody you love suddenly dying or yeah like that agreed with that i didn't disagree i simply put it off for for additional information i did not disagree so yeah sure that works if if that's what he's saying. if that's what he's saying and he literally could be saying exactly the opposite it is possible that his words could be interpreted to mean exactly the opposite of what i just said but it's not yes it is so let's continue forward Because there is immediate response versus long-term response, and he's not really getting into that. And th there's a lot of complexity here that is that's basically kind of being – he's having to put things in short, short terminology. And so, therefore, there's a lot of discussion around this that's necessary to, to really explore it properly. Mm -hmm. And that's why sometimes short terms like this can lead to possible mm -hmm. opposite, completely opposing um, interpretation. <laughs> yeah. You could, you could, I could see seeing that exactly the opposite and it also being correct in a different context. So, all right. Objects specified by uh, given map schemas are positively valence, the first dimension of emotion. If their appearance indicates, one, that progress is occurring 
and two, that the structural integrity of the current operative schema is valid and intact. So here we go. Now he's actually explaining it. We should have just continued forward. So many other times we just continued forward, and, uh, and this time I'm we sorry. didn't. All right. Um, I needed to understand right then and there. Yeah, I know. And, I'll, I'll and that was not possible. Yes, I know you were very, very. You were you were trying to uh, establish how how upset one could be when things. I'm I'm actually a little a little off today. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, what it's okay. With. All right. Sorry, um, guys. I'm not at my my peak performance today. Um, objects specified by a given map schema are positively valence, the first dimensions dimension of emotion. If their appearance indicates one that progress is occurring and two, that the structural integrity of the current operative schema is valid and intact. So what he's saying there is that the, uh, that the stru structural integrity of the cur currently operative schema, what he means by that is the highest level become a physician. And one, that progress is incurring is whether or not you got good grades. So that's what he's saying, Those, that's one and two. A working schema is therefore self-verifying as well as providing direct dopaminergically mediated incentive reward. Obstacles, by contrast, are negatively balanced. The first, the, the second basic emotional dimension. Their appearance indicates the schema world mismatch, danger to current progress, and the fact that the current map schema or hierarchy may not be functional. So you get bad grades, suddenly now your ability to become a physician may be in question, your whole world may be in question because mm -hmm. the lowest order the, the, the grades mm -hmm. has failed. Therefore, the higher order, become a physician, is in, danger. is in danger of actually being a good match. Maybe you can't be a physician because you're getting bad grades. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So it was the visual overlap of the V. I don't know that about was the that. Most that upsetting. makes no sense to me. Because it's the, it's the relationship between one and two. When one affects two. You just made a, 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 a chevron, not a V, visually to me. Well, it's he said in both. Okay. But either way, the the V, whenever you draw a V. Yeah. It overlaps. He said at the point is the most upsetting. So I was trying to figure out if there's you no, there, there's not it you've bottom. made the, those two lines up. Uh, the the V is supposed to be a bunch of stuff falling into a funnel kind of thing, not not two lines gotcha. overlapping. Never there's mind. not a, there's not two things to the V. Gotcha. Well, yeah. here is two things, so that's what I'm trying. No, to no, he's not gotcha. he's not saying that. it is the sort of the basic where the uh, fuck am i page uh, oh i think i i think it suddenly jumped pages let's let us see uh, oh, okay there we go the fact that the current map schema or hierarchy may not be functional if an obstacle does does appear it should first be evaluated for significance at narrowest and most specific level possible uh to use uh, such use of occam's razor limits the spread of chaotic emotion Elements of self diff, uh, elements of self differ in degree, not in kind. The upheaval produced by an obstacle is proportionate to the area of space and time structured by the erroneous schema. The solution may lie close at hand if the obstacle is merely something expected under different circumstances. Other times, however, the obstacle is too radically unknown for such easy dealings. Then the complexity of things reemerges with incom incomputable consequences. The borders between things becomes questionable and everything is up for grabs. This is the problem of chaos versus order, the eternal problem and the ultimate reality of the world. And he is citing himself. Yep. Okay, no, I see what he's saying because this actually is, is true of the way that evolution. Now I want to read his older shit. The way that evolution occurs. No, he's totally, he's totally right. I know. Um, the fact that he has made his work since 99 talking about complexity, chaos versus order, like, that's nice. Yep, that's, yep. A good, that's, okay. that's a good foundation. Uh, so, if an obstacle does appear, it should be first evaluated for significance at narrowest and most specific level possible. So, in other words, at the bottom of the V is the, your grades have gone bad. Right, so whenever you uh, but that whenever is, you encounter an obstacle, you need to look at the the basic of right. things. You can't suddenly doubt that you could ever like the first time you get a bad uh, grade. If you start doubting that you can even be a posi uh, a physician immediately, you're you're failing to properly keep things in a in a, in a stability situation. Say you need to be you can't, that chaos can't be allowed to spread. 
And instead, uh, you should be evaluating if you could get a better grades or not. Right. Or so such a use of Occam's razors limit, limits the spread of chaotic emotion. So I think what he's saying, the, how is this a use of Occam's razor? I think what he's mm -hmm. saying is that uh, keeping things simpler uh, at the bottom, the most bottom As level. It, uh, don't focus too much on the the, the, the long term end. The, lar just the larger. Fix it. Just go clean your room, as Jordan yeah. Peterson says. Don't worry that you are unlovable incel. Fucking clean your room. Yeah. Start simple. Okay. Uh, that that makes sense. Okay, cool. Uh, the borders between the things become questionable, and everything is up for grabs. Yeah, when the when the um. When something is too far away from, yeah, so you this can't is, really have any meaningful. So no, no wonder he must have really liked Kuhn as well, because this, the, the, these, this is basically an analog for what happens in the uh, the structure of scientific revolution as well. So he almost certainly loves Kuhn, and uh, and he's been able to apply it to the brain, and that and that is and that is extremely important in understanding the way that intelligence evolves, and, and because because basically evolution is a system that is like itself. A, a development of a brain uh evolution it, our brains it itself learns and evolution and <laughs> are very similar because it is basically a system for for finding correct information that's mm -hmm. what evolution is, is it's going through and finding, finding the most adaptable best suited for the because what is information information is a representation of something else and so so basically animals are a representation of the situations that they yeah, have you to would, you wouldn't need information if you didn't need if you didn't have to do stuff with it. Right, and so each each in, uh, individual animal is kind of like a, a map schema. It is a way of dealing with the world in a given situation. Mm -hmm. And so it is that. So right, I think I have... think that he po he possibly recognizes that and is you know, he hasn't brought that out specifically, but he's kind of inferring it. Well, we frequently talk about that in terms of a jungle where you have plenty of resources. Life will try to create as many different types of living beings. Right. Uh, to try to fit every possible circumstance, situation, whatever. So w whenever you have enough resources, that is just what happens. It creates every possible configuration, any kind, yeah. all the map schemas. <laughs> yeah, well, the reason for that, though, why I bring that out specifically mm -hmm. is because that is because you can't know when revolution will come. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you need as many different possible models to deal with all the problems that might occur. Mm -hmm. That's why, that's why uh, what, what you're talking about is the argument for diversity. A lot of people uh, who are intelligent have tons and tons of, bel uh, of arguments for simplicity, and they're mm -hmm. always going towards simplicity, whereas they do, they, a lot of times they don't understand the necessity of diversity that nature has developed. It's harder to manage yeah. diversity, but... But it's a, it's a necessity because, because the universe is unknown. One must have as many different plans possible that are workable plans, not just random mess, but real workable plans. Uh, right. as are possible and that is a, that is only limited by energy availability and yeah. so basically there is life a, itself needs to have as many tools as possible to deal with whatever the fuck is going on right so so looking at it from a, like an, uh, from economies you want as many different you know products and as many different services like you want a w wide variety of things mm -hmm. being developed in an right. economy uh, and the more uh, that wealth that more is available robust. in that economy, yeah. the more different you, you you end up creating, basically. Which is one of the reasons is, why monopolies are retarded. Right. <laughs> oh no, that's a, that's a good way of uh, of making something that. Okay, so Mono culture. The, so like, why is it why is it that we don't always have clones and genetics? This is one right. of the first things you learn in, in understanding complexity. Is that why do you why do you not why isn't everything the exact same genetics? Why why not? Why do you you know have the genetic diversity within a single species? Right. And that like is because because they will all be wiped out by one single virus mm -hmm. if they're all the same genes. And so it is the genetic d diversity that uh, that limits various things going wrong. Uh, it, it is d the diversity allows for a wide variety of things to go wrong and only parts of the system to be lost. Mm -hmm. And so you don't lose all the of the system. Thing, yeah. Uh, simultaneously if we were all the same genes one virus would kill everyone simultaneously and you know it life will start, start right anew. so the, so so any anything any uh species Billions of years of progress lost right. <laughs> down the drain. right down the drain any species that is that is uh built from clones alone is very it has to have some sort of extreme measure against viruses or something like that there has to be some sort of immunity to viruses that they've developed otherwise they're on the road to um now uh, I want to talk extinction. about lateral gene sharing because that seems 
partner. Oh, uh, yeah. In yeah. The... So anyway, so there's an understanding of the necessity of diversity in, in the development of robust systems mm-hmm. is something Whether it be that, life or ideas or... Right. right. That is something that or basically er, every kind of, every pedant, which I, I was once uh, one of, uh, they all need to be learning those sorts of things. Um, all right. We just hugged them all. The eternal problem, the ultimate reality of the world. Oh, where is it? <laughs> the, pro- the problem of chaos versus order. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Because chaos, a lot of times, that is just our That's perception. What I, mean. like, I want to read more of his older stuff. Well, I, I wonder it's if right he's... Right along our alley. You know, because he's talking about chaos, because there is a difference between complexity and chaos, and a lot mm-hmm. of times that is just perception and scale. It is, it's not... It, our ideas of chaos are not real most of the time. And I think he knows that, based on Maybe. how he started this. Maybe. Who knows? Well, he, he talked about borders being, you know... Arbitrary, arbitrary. yeah. Yeah, so, but he doesn't necessarily have to have come Follow to the right, right conclusion, right. even though he has the, the, good, the, the proper starting point. Right. All right. Um, we derive one important form of meaning, the sec- uh, security and hope, from the match between our personal map schemas and the social world. So security and hope is what he's saying. That's, that is uh, that's almost the what feeling you need. of meaning. So that's when he's talking about meaning. That's what you need meaning. for a revolution. Yeah. Guns and hope. <laughs> Gun security, same thing. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Uh, all right. Such ordered meaning emerges as consequence of the delim- delimitation of its paired opposite, chaos, whose manifestation produces the second kind of meaning. Hope. Okay, so chaos produces hope is what he's saying. Uh, I guess because because he's using the word chaos to represent everything, including uh, differentiation and uh, and new 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 circum new circumstances, new possibilities. Gotcha. Therefore, in, in which you know. Therefore, hope. hope. Right. Um, maintenance of map schema meaning keeps chaos in check rather than revealing it, uh, or allows it to be revealed in small in doses small enough to be tolerable. Determinate positive and negative events occur as the world manifests itself as tool and obstacle. Irrelevant things occur too, of course, but are in some important sense never realized. Hmm. Uh, No one can pay attention to all activity, only to all relevant activity. Uh, But what if seriously, what of seriously anomalous events? And see, unfortunately, he's not even talking about what is relevant changes. Right, tremendous. based on, yeah. But he, I think he's inferring it. Um, such a, Some occurrences are neither evidently good nor bad, nor immediately uh, eradicable as meaningless. Hmm. So in other words, you can't make a decision if it's good, bad, or irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are not understood, not explored. They cannot be placed into the context of the current map schema, nor encapsulated within the schema's hierarchically ordered, larger-scale conceptual surroundings. They violate the frame, interfering with its operation, its integrity, and its relationship to other frames. What must happen in such cases? We right. Ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I know he's saying that you can't ignore it either. Right. That's part of the, the you know. Sure. What, is, what is not comprehended but is still extant must logically be experienced as paradoxical. Uh, this is Young, Gray, and Peterson. Uh, not all together. There's 40 some papers of Young. Yes. But the fact that it's Young twice, I know yeah. he had academic publishing. Um, I, I don't agree that it's paradoxical. I think that's a poor use of the word. Mm. And even if all four of them used it, I think they're just following from a, tradi- a bad tradition. Because calling it paradoxical is... And Young might have used it because of the way he... Yeah, that's a paradox. Leaves. Must be something that is literally in conflict, and right. I don't. Uh, that's simply because it's it, it's um, hard to comprehend. Does not mean it's actually paradoxical, and that's a very poor use of the word paradox. Or maybe it feels like it feels incongruent. Incongruent, yeah. Incongruent should is uh, should be used, not paradoxical. All right. So uh, negative in potential pos- uh, negative in, negative in potential. Positive, in potential, irrelevant, in potential, and self and world in potential as well. What is not comprehended, but is still excellent, must logically be experienced as paradoxical. Okay. So he's saying it's negative, positive, irrelevant. Uh, Possible. Right. It's, it's what he's saying is it's all things. 
And so I could understand. Okay, so what he's saying oh, is it's, it's experienced as paradoxical. Okay, now I see what he's saying. You're feeling, as, you're feeling uh, uh, from it. It's not truly that, but your feeling of it is oh, is it, it, it's positive. It's negative. It's, it's all everything. because because it is on because it is it's unknown. unknown. Yeah. Right. That potential, the true complexity of the world, is chaos. Well, let's say it's the I'll say it's the feeling of chaos. The, its manifestation, no mere threat, constitutes a challenge to the full adaptive capacity of the individual. The emergence of chaos produces more uh, than mere anxiety, something more like generalized map schema disinhibition and competition as new and potentially appropriate means of framing war with each other for dominance. Okay, so the very map, the map schemas themselves, themselves yeah. uh, are at war because of the fact that there is this new situation that cannot be, uh, it could be exciting, uh, an exciting new potential for, for growth or a deadly, you know, it could be all of those things. It's, and I don't like that he says more than mere anxiety because uh, that's anxiety. That's where anxiety comes from when your map schemas are competing for yes. dominance. And that's why it's important to know that anxiety and excitement are basically the same. Uh, motivation for maintaining meaning is thus not merely desire to reduce anxiety, it is instead desire to avoid the internal and frequently external war of competing options. Which I would argue is one and the same. But I guess, because he once again would have the rationalization of like, oh, I just want to feel good. I don't want to feel anxious anymore. And so you might like go for a cigarette or for something else. Uh, but what you really need is to look deeper and adjust your map schemas. Right. That's what's really going to be. But it, it is And so what he's talking about is the, the is the value of talk therapy. <laughs> 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 All right. So which is uh, looking at what map schemas are, are in competition with each other and figuring and making a decision on which one is uh, is superior so that right. you can at least take action yeah. all right so uh, motivation for maintaining meaning is thus not merely desire to reduce anxiety is instead desire to avoid internal and frequently external war of competing options all right so that is when you have a, your meaning uh, determining your meaning of life is for this purpose is what he's saying right. you know, when we think of the idea of meaning which is such a vague Concept. But that's the whole point of space. Yep. Three forms the, of meaning. Yeah, the whole point is to, is to uh, develop this idea of meaning. Right. And there's something even deeper about the anomalous event. Uh, that doesn't seem to go. Very uh, I don't well. really understand that either. Yeah. Uh, at some point in psychological development, however, however hypothetical, all events are anomalous, uh, though they may be rapidly constrained by the social surround. So when you're first starting out, everything's new, therefore everything's anomalous. Mm -hmm. So is this, that why babies cry so much? <laughs> yes, everything's anomalous. Um, this means that the schemas allowing for the determinate utilization of objects, situations, and abstractions are dependent for their construction initially on information extracted from the overarching, ever-emerging domain of the unknown. It is for such reasons that chaos is meaningful a priori and the mother of determinate self uh, being itself. Uh, so, okay, so he's talking about the rapidly constrained by the social surround is that whenever we have anomalous events, we look to the group to put, to tell us what should I be doing with this new shit? And that's how we end up uh, building our minds from the social environment is, is because when we don't know what the fuck it is or what to do with it or where we should organize it, et cetera, we can end up using the social group to you know through their cues their their lack of response to it their whatever mm -hmm. to you know create a map schema from their map schema uh and and that's yeah, if you have nothing to go on right yeah. then then you you use what is already available and uh and that's how we have this this idea of social truth okay, okay so then um he didn't say that but i'm saying yeah. that. Uh, this means that the scheme is allowing for their determinate utilization of objects, situations, and abstractions dependent for their construction initially on in information extracted from the overarching, ever-emerging domain of the unknown. The scheme is allowing for their determination. Okay, the schemas themselves uh, are emergent, is what he's saying. It's like the... Um, the, the, what's happening creates the new schemas. Uh, it is for such reasons that chaos is meaningful a priori and the mother determinate being itself. Okay, so what he's saying is that um, the chaos, the unknowns, the things like that 
come together with the un, with the known that you're that you're stored already, whatever knowns you have, uh, uh, and that's what makes you an individual is the chaotic, uh, the chaos, the new things impacting and so uh with the structure of what you already have assembled and that creates a new schema uh, so in other words it's kind of like extrusion it's literally there's a shape to you know the way that you have organized the world and then this disorganized thing that doesn't really fit with it comes in impacts it and that whatever you already have combined with what you you know what is new creates something new a new map schema for dealing with this new situation based upon the older map schemas and their organization. So he didn't say that, but that's what he means. Um, all right, the appearance of the anomalous involuntary produces its own specific map schema, the orienting reflex or complex in more modern terms. Uh, the beginning point of that schema is the insufficiency of present knowledge. The desired endpoint is classification of the anomalous phenomenon and its reduction to specific meaning. So that's him say, saying in different words what I just said. Uh, increased sensory processing and exploratory activity is brought to bear on the uh, uncomprehended circumstance examined from the perspective of varying map schemas. Is it relevant to another motivational state? Can it serve as an, affordable, uh, an affordance or off obstacle? And at what level? Is it like other irrelevant objects and treatable as uh, ground? Such effortful exploration constitutes, one, the process by which identity originally comes to be, two, the elimination of possibility from the indeterminate domain of the anomalous to the finite domain of a de determinate map schema, three, the reworking of identity, which is the sum total of all ske uh, such schema. It is here where Swanson's work on the hypothalamic function once again becomes relevant. The hypothalamic rostral behavioral control segment establishes narrow, uh, biologically relevant uh, map schema, ingestive, reproductive, and defensive. So let's go back over that just a little bit, because we, we, what he's saying is basically what I was saying in a uh, different form, and so he's, he is actually explaining it. Um, so there's all these various things that you can get from this new information by comparing it to other uh, map schema. But in, in addition, the, the third point he has here is the reworking of identity, which is the sum total of all schema. So in other words, because of the fact that when something, that's, that was his point of this whole area here, is that when something brand new comes along, all of your map schema then start to become, they, they come in flux. And so therefore there is a possibility of them reorganizing uh, themselves because they are, um, they are weighted by, you know, uh, by the current set of all information. There's there's weighting and hierarchy, but once new information is available, then they are allowed to compete again. So they're in they are in flux, and they and the hierarchy of your various map schema. What is important? What is not important? Uh, what is the most important? You know, basically reevaluating your goals. Do I really want to be a physician? Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, has to be possible, and so therefore it does occur. And so the sum total of all the schema, the individuality, is changed by the incoming new information. So that's where the, the new information is is um, having an effect on the um, on the hierarchy. So so what he's talking about here is the necessity of revolution and how revolutions occur. And you even see it in social environments where you know one set of primates that was always at the top ends up becoming lower in the, the hierarchy. And so you, you see analogies for this situation happening in groups, uh, in, in systems organization. Yeah, so yeah. we're talking about uh, essentially a um, top-down identity. Identity as it is assigned to you by the group, not necessarily the identity that you feel yourself have created. No, I think he means identity as in like individual, wh how, individual. How, why, why is something individual? And that is, mm. It's all of its organization. Because he's quoting himself. I, I like that. that, that, that he's, it's, it's his own uh, yeah. postulation that one, the process by which identity originally, such comes to exploration be. constitutes the process by which identity originally comes to be. And okay, and so I think what he's saying theory. is the individual. In other words, how an individual becomes individual. And that is the, you know, mm -hmm. um, 
the emergence of the combination of, of whatever set of schema that one individual had combined with this new information and that competition uh, event that reorganizes it. And then each of these subsequent reorganizations over time is what an individual is. Um, okay. And so it is, uh, it is here where Swanson's work on hypothalamic function once again becomes relevant. So he's saying this, this reworking and retooling of identity, which is the sum total of all schema. Uh, the hypothalamic rostral behavioral control segment establishes narrow biologically relevant map schema. So ingestive, reproductive, defensive. So he's saying that uh, it be the very basic uh, systems become relevant again whenever there is a um, reorganization. So, okay, so basically then that now once your map schema are in flux, mm -hmm. reorganizing all of them with the consideration of the new information has to go back down to the deepest levels of, you know, reproduction and, and survival. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that makes sense. The caudal segment, by contrast, is the origin point of the ventral tegmental dopaminergic system, which Odd governs, <laughs> which governs approach and exploratory, uh, exploratory behavior and whose activation is experienced as incentive reward. Thus, the hypothalamus has a powerful primordial backup system which grips control when uh, its more specific rostral systems fail in their efforts. So basically the idea is you, you go back down to a more primitive state when you are stuck in a uh, you re uh, when you're stuck in analysis paralysis mm -hmm. because there's too many different possibilities and right. your map schemas are all and you in, don't know what any of them are going to lead to right then there is the uh, backing down to the the backup system of survival and reproduction uh, is is the natural you know uh, Basic hypothalamus the, function. <laughs> the natural way to solve that problem um, uh, explore Exploration in the face of the unknown is thus as ancient as hunger, thirst, sex, and, uh, and aggression. It, it is a primary drive, manifesting itself in the form of orienting, uh, orienting complex. Wait, manifesting itself in the form of the orienting complex, under the control of the septal, hippocampal, and interior, interior cingulate CNS systems. And this is why I argue that when you give people something like a universal basic income, they will not just sit there on their asses because exploration is an integral part of us as species. We can't help but want to do stuff. It is baked into our being. And hey, Jordan Peterson says so. <laughs> uh, I don't know that I would follow uh, the the you you seem to have switched contexts uh, there. So the, well, the saying that that, uh, mm -hmm. that he's saying that exploration is as basic as. Uh, sex, food, and yes, aggression. But it is, it is exploration upon a, a getting different information than is normal. Oh, so it's just exploration just of any kind. Because you're, you're constantly getting information. Yeah, but it's when, when a system is threatened. When a system, uh, when a system, when your, when your stable state of how you work and what you believe and what you do and how you, in the direction you're going and all of that shit is upset in any way, then that backs down to a more survival and reproduction state. So instead, the, I thought the direction, sh hold all. on just one second, let me continue. The, um, the, so I thought where you were going was specifically that when, uh, when people are driven to a state that where things are unknown they, and, they, uh, and they're more in flux, they become more animalistic and that is accurate. Yeah. And so when you instill more safety, they become less animalistic. And when you instill a stability through, and they're not worried about, you know, survival, mm -hmm. uh, those most basic things, right. uh, then, then they're not, then, then the, their ability to work within a complex system is enhanced. Right. Uh, but I will also argue that, um, uh, what was it stress about, um, you said when the, when the system is threatened, uh, when there's a mismatch, uh, the organism uh, develops exploration on par with aggression and reproduction. So I don't necessarily agree with that in our current uh, system because a lot of times what ends up happening is depression. Whenever your schemas are violated, you don't explore. You shut down. 
Right. Well, that's um, that's the thing. He's he's missing one of the two, and what happens more frequently actually is the shutdown. Right. Um, because of uh, learned, then, he's not dealing with learned helplessness and and things like that. Yeah, because he's just seeing that there is the motivation. This actually is the hyper conservative uh, view of things. It's like, well, as soon as things get bad, you know, the you know they, they get going. And it's like, well, that's not actually true. More complex systems a lot of times shut down, uh, waiting for more information instead of immediately taking action, which could be detrimental. Uh, immediately taking action is a more simplistic method of dealing with problems immediately just take action any action all action that is a very dangerous way of doing things whereas a more complex system should a lot of times wait for more information however both of those two strategies have their own flaws and faults and that's why you have more conservative versus liberal um, ways of going wrong conservatives go wrong by just immediately taking the wrong action and fucking everything up liberals that go wrong by not taking any action and falling and just everything falling apart because you're not taking action so it's like that's the two extremes that we go wrong in, and, and both of those are, the, are ways in which they fail. Uh, and that those both are under the same circumstances. He's only exploring and only mentioning the more conservative mindset, which is immediately just start taking action from whatever, you know, just, just start getting, just get going. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. And there's a, <laughs> you know, there's a, uh, there's good reason for that. And, it, it, and each one of those strategies works within the right context for that strategy. However, there's no way of knowing which strategy which, is yeah. superior, which is why both strategies are maintained genetically. That's why we have both strategies. That's why we have the conservative and liberal. And you know, we go whenever things start to fail around us, you may t pick one of those two, and uh, depending on your proclivity. And so, the, 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 but both of them can go terribly wrong, or they can be the solution. Uh, so anyway, all right, let's go continue forward from there because right. he did not identify the the one the other way, which mm -hmm. is the depression. Yeah. Depression, and, and a lot of times, the, the what's funny is the what happens to the brain during depression really is a matter of attempting to reorganize. That's it's interesting. I mean, if you look at all the ways that, that um, various um, uh, what's it called receptor densities change and things like that. It's really interesting. The, the, yeah, the, the gray white matter. Yeah, it's all. It is all myelination, about all that um, interesting stuff. Re reorganization. Right. Um, all right. I don't know if uh, we're being disagreed with or Chad is disagreeing with Chad. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. The um, which side, I guess, is talking about the fierce urgency of change. I've never heard that expression, so I can't. Yeah. Uh, well, there's. I, I don't know. One thing is keep in mind. I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't know what you specifically what you're talking about there, but uh, the um, there is a uh, don't don't confuse uh, Democrat and liberal, and don't confuse conservative and Republican, and don't confuse people who say they're progressives with actual progressives. Right, but uh, I think what he's what he's trying to um, uh, refer to is the the, the climate change and uh, coming uh, apocalypse sort of uh, discussion. That seems to that is very frequently associated with liberal um, but I don't agenda. See how that's, and, and how that's, that in any way flows from what you said there. Because usually liberals uh, fail in uh, oh, in, doing in analysis paralysis. They get stuck in analysis paralysis, whereas uh, conservatives usually are, are take take action immediately. But it's usually the wrong action because you don't have enough information. And well, but but it's still well, it, that's get, still, can you get off me? That is still accurate because we have the the GOP and other camps that are like take action of continuing to do the absolute most damage that we can't possibly do, take out absolutely everything and ran the shit, rape the earth of everything it has because we're the strongest as humans. Yeah, that's the action that they're taking. Yes, but what they're saying is, uh, and, and usually it's, there is, the, the, when you look at those, the arguments, basically conservatives usually are saying, we don't have enough information. We don't know uh, whether or not it's uh, the, uh, you know, humans that are causing it. So all ahead forward in the way that we were already doing things. And then, you know, you, liberals are, are more along. It's like, oh, it's absolutely human caused. And even though they're and we're going to ignore the, these other, you know, things. And so there is when you're talking about the organization of groups mm -hmm. uh, versus the way that in, in an individual works. Uh, I, th I think there's that that's part of the discussion here that mm -hmm. we're, you know, 
that, well, that Charles, about, Charles is talking about groups, whereas I'm talking about individuals ah. of a certain... Um, and, of course, they talk about wisdom of crowds, which is actually uh, the most ironic statement ever because, you know, we know crowds are dumber than the individual yeah. people that are... Yeah, thing, things <laughs> often change at scale, and they often flip at scale. And so, yeah. it, so it may be that conservatives uh, at scale, at the group scale, may, be, may behave more like liberals as a group, uh, as an individual liberal, whereas um, liberals, a, as a group, behave more like a conservative individual. Um, and yes, please don't call Obama a liberal. <laughs> the the guy who ordered the most drone strikes in the history, well, until Trump, in the history of ever, yeah, no, he's not actually a liberal. Anyone who's pro-war and bombing individual innocents <laughs> yeah. is not a progressive, is not a liberal. Please don't confuse Democrats and liberals. <laughs> yeah, they're not even remotely similar. And I, I don't think this. I think the same thing is true of uh, of Republicans and conservatives. A lot of Republicans are uh, just do not represent conservatives at all. And the uh, first urgency of change was about the economic system, actually, not the climate. Oh, okay. The well, Obama slogan, but either way. Oh, okay. Whatever. Um, but yeah, which of course Obama is now. Um, just, just because there is urgency of change, though, also doesn't mean that you have a plan and that you actually will do something. Exactly. So there. So you know. The left likes to talk a lot. But not necessarily do that. As a, as a matter of fact, analysis paralysis is categorized by the belief and understanding that things need to change without being able to do so. And then, and the all, all ahead forward is the belief and uh, and acceptance of the idea that nothing needs to change, nothing needs to be examined. We've got it all right. Go straight ahead forward, uh, and take action. You know, just just take action. And so, uh, so that actually still does follow from what I was saying. It's just there, there's some nuance to it. And especially, we have like eighty thousand plans on how to. Combat climate change, and we're not doing any of them. Right, right. So, but we know we need to change. So, like, as an example. Yeah. So, this, so there can be an urgency. Uh, I think a depressed person has a tremendous urgency of change, and a uh, and a person who is who is not depressed. Capability of doing anything. And, yeah, and and their and and their fear and and, and upset about their. Um, about the need to change a lot of times is what keeps them from actually changing because they, it's like they're, it's very important for them to make the decision right. And, you know, whereas somebody who is in a, in a more steady and uh, actually a more conservative mindset is, uh, is actually just making the decision. Uh, they're, just, they're just going forward and, uh, and they're not considering a necessity to change because they're comfortable that things are going well, that things are, they're doing things the right way. Uh, and so, and sometimes, you know, and, and keep in mind, I'm not giving a value, uh, proposition. Exactly there is each, each one of these has values that are important. Like you, it, it is extremely important to we win. We just like to point out flaws in everything. Right. There, <laughs> well, it, okay. Going back to the idea of conservative versus liberal, the, you know, you cannot, the, uh, this, the classical story of persistence apparently comes from the bicycle. Like a, a lot of times people tell the story of what? Oh, okay. Well, I don't, I don't know. There was, there was a, <laughs> there was a story anyway. The, but there are stories of um, people st staying the course, and uh, when, when all else fails. That was fails. my favorite imagination. Okay. I was like, wouldn't it be great if I, I don't the bicycle know if that's... inventor actually hated fucking horses? No, that's not what I was oh, talking okay, about. Okay. No. Uh, but there's there are there are stories of where a person had they not stuck to all stuck to the course even though there were all these negative things saying this is a bad course to go this is this is bad don't do it it's signs not going to work out <laughs> right where you get these these signs that you should you, and you stay the course anyway it's only through that kind of persistence in the face of negative input that you actually accomplish a lot of the various important things that we have accomplished mm -hmm. so there is a even to the point of dysfunctionality of staying the course and paying no attention that is crucial so and your then map schema is telling you a oh, guy <laughs> right and then there are times when you know immediately recognizing the necessity of a change and making the change is also you know something that leads to a, a, an extreme that success like that falls among the genders too yeah yeah it does yeah the guys stay the course yeah, guys are thankless 30 years fucking right. determined Staying the course, and then women are like new thing every day, which yeah. you know you need both. Right. Yeah. Well, you need a balance of both, right, and right. you actually not just a balance, but a balance of balances, which is uh, a cycling. That's how uh, that's how all, all homeostasis systems work. Is they don't stick in the middle, which is basically a, a dead, worthless, you know, half measure, but cycling back and forth between 
you know some some larger portion of one and a larger portion of the other back and forth and that's a, that's how homeostasis systems work and that's how our brains are supposed to work with the liberal and conservative values we're supposed to be fluctuating back and forth across a middle line not stuck in some worthless middle all right anyway all right this let's go back to reality oh the right. ghost rabbit <laughs> let's go back to the study here or the paper um read the word study and spat it out. <laughs> I hear that coming today all the time. <laughs> all right. Um, powerful primordial backup system, which grips control when its more specific rostral systems fail in their efforts. Exploration in the face of the unknown is thus an a uh, as ancient as hunger, thirst, sex, and aggression. I, I agree. And, and so there be, <laughs> it is very ancient. Yeah. Exploration, whenever shit uh, hits the fan, go explore, otherwise you die. Um, is it primary? Which is uh, why we have high risk, high reward uh, brain tags that are supposed to arrive. Yeah. The gamblers. Yep, you have to gamble when things go when things are going wrong. You got to fucking gamble. Um, manifesting itself in the form of orienting com uh, orienting complex under what? the control. What? what? I'm reading. It is the primary drive. Ah. Manifesting itself in the form of orienting complex, of the orienting complex. Okay, Whew. complex as a noun. Uh, <laughs> under yeah. the control of the septal, hippocampal, and anterior singlet CNS systems. That's one of the best. All right. All right. In 2001, shortly before her death, uh, Makovlich? <laughs> Vinogradova. 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 God, I'm just going to mispronounce it, and it's we're okay. going to be okay with that. Yes, we are. Vinogradova. Just call her Vino. Fine. Vin <laughs> Vino. Uh, uh, delivered her final opinions on orienting complex system function. She described the hippocampus as an interface between primeval brainstem systems and newer learning dependent cortical systems. I totally agree. Yeah. Sensory information from the outside world is fed in a bottom up fashion through the brainstem systems into hippocampal subarea CA3, providing a quick and dirty portrait of ongoing events. True. After a lag, Due to increased complexity of processing, information about what is currently desired is fed downward into the hippocampus, uh, first into uh, area CA1, where it is simplified, and then into CA3, where it is compared to with the pre-processed brainstem input. Which is why, whenever you experience something that causes a particularly intense galvanic skin response, you gotta take a breath. <laughs> Let that lag you know, transpire right. until the information gets fed back down to your CA3. If the two inputs match, CA3 sends a message to the RAF nuclei in the brainstem. These nuclei in turn suppress activity of the ascending excitatory reticular formation, which is responsible for increasing brain arousal, intensifying attention, increasing sensory uh, throughput via the thal thalamus, placing the body in a state of alertness and preparation for action disinhibiting motivation, heightening anxiety, and potentiating exploration. So when you're anxious, you just want to go do shit? Oh. This dissolution <laughs> into chaos as the nervous system's response to the emergent chaos of nature, as order dissolves and transforms in the natural world, so it must be, so it must in the intrapsychic and social worlds, so that adaptation can continue. A rat's a priori state in a novel environment, for example, is dysregulation of motivation and affect, heightened alertness, and a slowly developing inclination to explore. So basically, there is a. Uh, well, that's he's contradicting himself. He's a talking little bit, about yes. it being depressed in a new environment. No, no, what he's saying, not depressed well, uh, in, in a longer term sense, but in a, a short term. Uh, this in a, dis, dysregulation of, of motivation means you get. Oh, oh, I misread that. Slowly get, developing inclination. So to get explore. still and start start uh, becoming Planning curious. Planning to okay, I I read that completely the opposite. My bad. Yeah. Um. This is a phasic behavioral analog to the state of affairs, permanently uh, characterizing an animal, decorticated. Uh, such that its hypothalamus now uh, occupies the highest level of CNS control remaining. Right, it's it's on its most animal form, where it's like the the cortical, uh, the sort of the conscious. If we're going to talk about humans, uh, that's gone. Bye bye. It's it's on its base. Um, fear, flight, explore. Mm -hmm. 
lowest level of central nervous system functioning. Okay. So this dissolution into chaos is the nervous system's response to the emergent chaos of nature. That's correct. Uh, I'm, I'm going back and rereading what we're talking about here and that they're trying to, you know, re, you know, re, um, reevaluate this, this, uh, area. Okay. So the, cause he's still talking about chaos. Mm -hmm. So the chaos being the unknown. So his, In his word chaos is really a, a, our perception. It's not real chaos extant in the world. It's our feeling perception lack of a schema our affect of chaos uh our um and then that dissolution into chaos that uh we also uh experience in other words our brain re reassigning re-evaluating map right. schema is the nervous system's response to uh, emergent chaos in nature so uh that's a not a good way of putting it okay as order dissolves and transforms in the natural world so it must be in the intrapsychic and social world so the adaptation can continue so he's saying that as things change in the world so things have to change in the brain that's basically it all right um in a nonverbal animal such as a rat the transition from frozen anxiety to active exploration and mapping begins with cautious sniffing under the spell of brain systems that minimize exposure to predators uh, the animal soon switches to vision uh, using appropriate head movements, then begins to move, assessing territorial layout and significance as something occurring in response to its own actions. For an isolated rat in a cage, uh, territory is something as simple as spatial layout, hence the cognitive map or spatial models of hippocampus function, uh, buttressed by findings of hippocampal uh, place cells. Hmm. Uh, other researchers, however, note hippocampal enabling of um, transitive associations, relations uh, between arbitrary stimuli, and um, and suggest that. Okay, let, let, I'm reading that poorly. This is there's too many um, interruptions in this yeah. sentence. For an isolated rat in a cage, territory is something as simple as spatial layout. Hence, the cognitive map or spatial models of hippocampal function, buttressed by findings of hippocampal place cells. Other researchers, however, note hippocampal enabling of transitive associations, relations between arbitrary stimuli, and suggest that place cell function is broader identification of context. Context can also mean behavioral task uh, demand or meaning. Representation of such context uh, may well be equivalent to episodic memory, another hippocampal function. Just really simple, a lot of words, or mm, are, you, are they saying that spatial layout? Um, is part of context basically in, in episodic memory, and, and I think they're just talking about how it goes from, from one system to the next. There's this, there's a transition from one to the next to the next that leads to, um, leads to memory. I guess is his point. Let's go forward. Uh, investigators analyzing cognitive maps study the behavior of isolated animals. However, many animals are social. Their primary environment is, therefore, the dominance hierarchy they occupy locally. Uh, primates, like rats, develop detailed maps of their social structures as they transform across generations and decades. The place mapped by the cognitive map is thus a social structure, not just a geographical locale. The map is precisely the map schema hierarchy grounded in motivation, expanded through individual socialization into complex human culture. Proper understanding of hippocampal function therefore appears dependent on the assessment of certain features of territories currently given no consideration. Proper understanding of hippocampal function therefore appears dependent on the assessment of certain features of territories currently given no consideration. Territories are not places of relatively predictable objects in their in interactions, but complex and dynamical social dramas 
whose behavioral associated contextual meanings depend upon the reactions of potentially unpredictable conspecifics. So, um, I guess he's getting to the fact that we have to create probabilistic models that are not, uh, not you know, solid models like a physical map. Um, most animals solve this problem by consorting only with familial peers whose behaviors have already been mapped and which are additionally constrained by their particular positions in the map schema hierarchy. The cortex can predict the outcomes of interactions with such conspecifics and work so they remain positive. Uh, conspecifics are, you know, just the same, same animal. Um, these predictions slash desires generally match information about a known conspecifics behavior as it uh, occurs and is fed bottom up into the hi hippocampus through the brainstem st uh, systems. Uh, the hippocampus registers match and the arousal systems, anxiety, aggression, panic, exploration, etc., remain tonically inhibited. So they don't, they don't respond. No threat is detected. No possibility for damage manifests itself. No disinhibition of motivation and emotion is necessary. No increase in allostatic uh, load and uh, with its stress-induced physiological perturbation and damage occurs. I need some water. I was just looking at ahead, and um, we are, we're getting there. We got about four to five pages, because uh, five of them are, um, five out of 23 are references. Yep. And I was thinking um, that we could push this into the after show, essentially, uh, since I've been addressing questions from chat as much as possible, and then we could leave it at the balance between order and chaos. Uh, for the so, next gen, maybe. right, and so we can we can finish essentially two pages. Okay, is what we have left, um, and then we'll be able to do an after show. Well, it seems like I'm getting unnecessarily uh, bogged down because it doesn't it doesn't seem to be saying anything particularly interesting novel. in this area. Or novel. Um, let's see. Let's continue forward. Uh, rats adapted to a predictable, ecologically valid social and territorial environment with nesting burrows, social interactions, and roaming space react with sheer horror to the unexpected side of a cat in their hetero, heretofore safe, predictable environment. This is a violation of physical geographical match. The animal's behavior changes dramatically for 24 hours, equivalent to a human month. Initial freezing followed by a uh, flight to the a chamber system gives way to a period of immobility during which the rats petrified by motivational and emotional dysregulation emit ultrasonic alarm cries at a high rate. Immobilized uh -huh. crying gradually transforms into risk assessment where the cat uh, appeared. Uh, the still stressed but now curious rats poke their heads out of their burrows and scan the previously cat contaminated open area <laughs> for hours. When the rats finally emerge, they explore in a manner that reduces their visibility to predators employing short corner, turn, corner runs and in and out of the open area. They run in to test it. Yeah. Uh, these exploratory risk assessment actions help the rats gather information about the possible danger uh, source. The marshalling of such information provides the rationale for their return to non-defensive behaviors, a.k.a. normal life. It got me at the ultrasonic cries. <laughs> Animals are equally sensitive I to like disruption that. of social geography, the dominant structure, and consequent mismatch. So in other words, when, when uh, things are incongruent in the social environment, they're just as horrific. Uh, children, uh, much as adults, willingly punish rule breakers. Interesting. Analogous behavior pervades the, uh, the animal kingdom. If a well -loved I'm sure children punish rule breakers even more than adults. Yeah. If a well-loved rat is removed from its familial surroundings, provided with a new odor, and returned, it will be promptly dispatched. Aww. Rats identify uh, one, of, one another by smell. A new rat constitutes unexplored territory. His presence is thus regarded not unreasonably as a threat to security. Chimps, per per perfectly capable of killing foreign devils, <laughs> uh, act in the same manner. Uh, why do such reactions occur? Uh, because a conspecific in a known action meaning context is predictable, even desirable. An unfamiliar conspecific, by contrast, could undermine the entire map schema dominance hierarchy structure, as his capacity for challenge and revolution remains unspecified. 
So basically, removal of chaos. If this is if this chaos can be immediately removed and we can return back to well-established map schema, then we instead of disrupting the map, map schema, we will remove the the, the 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 chaos. So uh, he, though he's not saying that, that is uh, obviously you know right. what can be he's gleaned from this. He's inferring he, it. Yeah, right. Uh, the importance of map schema hierarchy, the utility of conceptualizing it as the structure within which experience manifests itself, and its simultaneous intrapsychic and social existence, uh, may be additionally in illustrated by the fact that social status transformation produces functional change in the most basic serotonin serotonergic neurotransmitter system. High status elevates serotonergic, uh, serotonergic tone Decreasing negative and increasing positive emotion. Oh, no. If your personal schemas come first in the social group, your environment is stable, productive, and safe, and you are confident, upright, positive, and emotionally stable. If your schemas come last, however, everything is negative and dangerous. You are confused, anxious, and depressed, hovering close to the edge of chaos and disintegration. It is for such reasons that hierarchy maintenance and protection is so important to animal and human alike and that the position within the hierarchy is vital. Meaning system disruption affects serotonergic function, uh, a broader category by far than, than mere regulation of anxiety. I want to talk about that because there's recently uh, actually a talk that I think I shared uh, in Discord uh, where they were basically talking about how uh, we have definitely seen an increase in a disaffected state of men. Uh, that could be monitored through, for instance, mass shootings or the suicides or a variety of ways in which men are feeling pressures and uh, essentially the depression and anxiety of the newer generation as well as the mental health issues that men go through uh, has been linked to increasing um, economic... Uh, yeah, I think that, that men may be more... Um vulnerable to the fact the effect that he's talking about yeah. here unfortunately a lot of these studies when they're studying rats etc they only they end up not studying males there's, there's been a there's been a categorical lack of recognizing the um the, the difference between genders and neuroscience <laughs> uh, when you look at things from a longer term perspective okay. unfortunately I do, I do have to say one thing um the consensus in neuroscience is that you cannot tell a male brain from a feel br female brain per se however if you know this is the female, that is the male, you can easily match them up if you know that there's a difference. Because you have to look in certain areas to see where the difference is, but when a neuroscientist is just looking at a brain, just looking at activation, theoretically they're like, it could be anything. And then you have to look at specific areas to try to determine if it's male or female. Well, no shit. That's called right. identifying one thing but from another. But there's been a straw man where it's like neuroscientists can't tell if it's male or female, and then uh, the other camp is like, yes, they can because we have gender, we have dimorphic areas. Yes, we do, and you have to look yeah, at them if you specifically. Don't, I mean, technically, if you don't know what categorizes a male from a female, then you can't tell the difference between them. That's a basic. basic I, yes. That's a basic. <laughs> idea about reality but if the there are two things bring it up, if so. there's two things and you don't know what separates those two things then you can't tell one from the other exactly. yes that's a very basic truth of intellect yes but it's been something that they've been it's been a gotcha thing for, but it's not a gotcha yeah. it's an imbecile's gotcha yeah. it's a complete it's, literally mean, an imbecile's gotcha well the world we live in right yeah <laughs> okay uh, so, so anyway. <laughs> the point is yeah we we have not been studying gender dimorphism Nearly as much as we should. Right. So there, there are things that are categorically male and female. I mean, yes, certain brains will tend towards one area and towards the other, and and there are, there are exceptions. And, and there is an ex a spectrum, and there is crossover. So a a male brain could look more like a female brain. In certain, if the mother had cortisol in third trimester, and, it, and but then the thing is, there's rules and there's exceptions, and as yeah. a rule, there's a greater number of brains that look more categorically male than those that cross over and look uh, more like the female category, and the same vice versa. There is more female brains in total that look like the the the, the female rule than the ones that cross over and start to look like the male rule. Uh, and but so there are exceptions and there is crossover and that is true and you so therefore 
especially if you get those brains that are in the middle and you get you're given exceptional brain then yes yeah, that is true yeah, a neuroscience would not necessarily be able to tell if it's a male or female brain that is true but that is the exception and but there is a useful rule but you also can tell but you also can tell because <laughs> there is a rule and, and generally as a rule there is a, a because it's a spectrum yes there is so difficulty that's for the pedants on the left they use the straw man like right. you can't tell what yeah. brain it well, is well fuck them all right so anyway uh <laughs> The um, so what we're talking about here is that as a uh, when your set of map schemas is not dominant because you are not in, oh what I was getting the to men that, are more um, that I think that like one of the things that we find is that that serotonergic tone is something that is more categorical of females than of males and so tone meaning. Uh, overall activity, uh, um, I, I believe, is sort of the more dominant neurotransmitter. Right. In other words, where you if see we can it, paint it with a broad brush. Yes, painting with very, very broad brush. Um, <laughs> painting with a, a wall. Yes, th throwing paint <laughs> at a wall. Um, there is a, um, there, the, you know, men are more associated with dopamine, women more associated with serotonin. Uh, and uh, and so I which think is that why means more that women uh, come up with saying a depressed diagnosis, uh, and which is why men are we call them born addicted to sex because they have a strong right. drive for dopamine. And I think I think that men uh, that that hierarchy may be more important to men than it is to women in cer in a certain context in a certain way. Samurai are an indication. <laughs> Japanese society is an indication. Right. <laughs> and I think that men are more reliant upon the structure, uh, whereas women are more capable of dealing with the chaos. Acceptance. In other words, without I think I think generally this is my opinion i think mm -hmm. women uh generally when things are more chaotic it, it they are less there's less less of a disturbance affect they do, do not experience as much disturbance Their in, schemas aren't as disruptive in in a chaos uh, in a slightly more chaotic environment than men are i think men actually rely on both hierarchy and stability a little more to keep from becoming dysregulated overall well, I would highly agree with that in the sense that I think that indicates that women just have more schemas which are constantly mm -hmm. more map schemas which is experientially the case you have more I think they have more more, more alternatives exactly yeah they have and 80, it, schemas that I they're think keeping. that they I think that it's, it being more in flux is uh, is a is a norm that mm -hmm. female brains are more uh, resilient to yeah and it seems like masculine brand brains may have just one or two schemas and they, they well, just, no, no. There's, you know, it, that, that's a, that's a misrepresentation of what map schema are. There, there's well, far more of them. Well, but in other words, they 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 have more. Um, you're talking about the, They have stronger. Uh, you're talking about the hierarchy of yes, the map schemas. They, they have they, a more rigid hierarchy of schemas. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, yes. I agree with that's that. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, We're at the top. Meaning system disruption affects their hygienic function broader category by far than mean ways. Yep. All right. The consequence of map schema shattering, particularly at low resolution. Uh, what they mean at ro low resolution is. Uh, what do they mean? Uh, low the, importance? The grades. No. He, he, resolution is a horrible word, term for this. This he does. That's a bad. That's a very bad uh, use of terminology. What does he mean? Uh, what he means at low resolution is he means at the at the more finite level where you're dealing with the grades instead of the oh, oh, uh, right, right, becoming right. a physician. Gotcha. Um, fundamental, uh, at, particularly at low resolution, fundamental levels can be dramatic neurophysiologically speaking. Post-traumatic stress disorder produces increased susceptibility to anxiety, depression, obesity, infectious illness, and heart disease, as well as hippocampal shrinkage as a consequence of chronically elevated cortisol levels. Such shrinkage may occur because MAP schema dependent inhibition of motivation and emotion by the hippocampus should be demolished for functional reasons. When the models of the hippocampus uh, relies, when the models the hippocampus relies on to justify such inhibition have been proved wrong. Such, re uh, oh, excuse me. Recent research indicates that treatment with antidepressant serotonin reuptake inhibitors, whose biochemical effect uh, essentially mimics the pharmacological state characteristic of stable, high-dominance anim animals, allows for hippocampal neurogenesis, as well as improvement in episodic memory function. Uh, this is potentially the physiological manifestation of a reconstruction of a functional 
map schema hierarchy. So basically what they're saying here is that um, social position, uh, a like loss of social position can literally be brain damaging. Uh, and, um, and using uh, SSRIs uh, theoretically could lead to return of the, the, the higher um, serotonin state that is like being higher in the hierarchy. And, uh, and the post-traumatic stress is basically uh, often comes from, it is a, an analog of being in a lower social status. And that's true that they like, a, um, especially a male rat they found, like they put a male rat in a, uh, a social status position, like social defeat stress, and they'll actually uh, go from mounting behaviors to presenting behaviors. They'll actually switch from- Presenting is what females do when they put their butt right, up from, in the air to be From mounted. male to female, they're actually the, the uh, and so there's these various things that, uh, and I think talking about what I was saying earlier, that is an adaptive change uh, to a brain type where it can become more female to deal with uh, being in flux. And so therefore, it, it, there is an adaptation to become more feminine uh, under social stress, I believe. Uh, and that's the, He's not saying that here. I am. Well, but, but and also in humans, um, that's, that's, um, there's a parallel for that where uh, one of the ideas is that well, the reason why we, the gamer has survived uh, homosexuality in men uh, has survived despite uh, it being um, you can't reproduce when you're no. homosexual. It is because they essentially take the role of the female caretaker uh, and are there to protect the children, to take right. care of the children, to get to feed and them. And I, I think it's also why feminine behavior. Like some of the things people say, oh, the you know rise and fall of civilization can be traced to homosexuality. And it's like I, I think that's completely wrong in a certain a way. Right, but there is a when when civilizations become larger, there is more social stress, and so I believe that the the rise of homosexuality in a uh, in a civilization that has more social stress in it does actually make sense. It's not. It's an. I think it's a positive adaptation that allows those brains to work within the new system, but it's not. And so instead of seeing it the way that the the more simple, you know, that's a part of the destruction of civilization. No, it's just part of what happens as a civilization becomes stressed out and you know there's there's problems and so brains start adapting um so anyhow they that they're talking about here is and also ssris have been proven to cause like massive problems so it's a temporary stop Actual gap. dysregulation yeah huge huge problems uh, and so we, we won't won't get into that but yes increase of serotonin serotonergic tone does make sense that there is a um uh and at, that that changes something in a way that makes it uh, makes us capable of dealing with I, I believe the specific way that it does it is it allows us to deal with more possible map schemas that and keep them in flux and keep them maintained as possible instead of uh, having a stricter hierarchy of the way that things should be so in other words there is more uh, allowance of variation in the plan uh, instead of uh, having a one best plan there is a and, and so there's basically an allowance for more you know fluctuation in general um, and so that sort of makes sense to somebody who is very secure in their position socially if things changing isn't that big of a deal because if you're at the top of the hierarchy you have a tremendous amount of of a buffer all those underneath you will basically bear the brunt of the difficulty when you're high in like a primate um, that, that's how a lot of the gregarious primates live in such vastly different environments is they they basically sort of feed off of the, their underlings the underlings if there is a difficulty of survival they're, they're going out and they're you know gathering resources and the, and the lower ones on the hierarchy are the ones who end up getting killed and you know by by difficulty in situations because the the resources end up going up the hierarchy and so there, there is a change in, in situation really isn't a whole lot to worry about if you are, if you have that buffer of all the, of, of all your underlings, basically. <laughs> so it makes sense that they would not be as stressed out in a higher, uh, uh, serotonin, serotonergic state. All right. So Vinogradova, Vinogradova, God damn it. That's hard to say. Yeah. It, it seems like it say. wouldn't be every time. I don't expect my mouth to fail at this, <laughs> and then I do it. It, it does. It's it like does, well, it, does seem very it looks so easy. I'm looking right at it. It's like this seems easy. 
<laughs> Vinagradova. Vinagradova. God damn it. Why does my mouth not want to do this? <laughs> T-R-V-A. That's just American mouth or, or English. Gradova. Gradova. Vinagradova. Okay. Works. Uh, Vinagradova's work also sheds light on the neurophysiological instantiation of the MAP schema, allowing in potential for a development developmental description of the relationship between the development of schema hierarchies and their relationship to the tonic regulation of motivation and emotion extending beyond that of Swanson to the very domain of abstraction. She points out first that habituation of the orienting response should be regarded instead as negative learning and that it is the it, that is disappearance and that its disappearance is a consequence of the elaboration of an increasingly detailed model of the stimulus. So, what about first? She's talking about as you're exposed to something or as a brain is exposed to something, a stimulus, uh, it, gra it gains more of a detailed model and therefore habituation occurs and then we have what um uh what's it called um uh, latent inhibition right so they, they they're talking about latent inhibition here so how it is that you get used to things being as they are right um this modeling occurs as a consequence of sequential learning and the structures that receive ca1 hippocampal field inputs the mammillary bodies anterior th thalamic nuclei and finally the cingulate uh, limbic cortex. The higher up the uh, neural hierarchy above the hippocampus the structure, the more repetitions of the event are necessary to shape the response. She believes that this hierarchy may be reg uh, regarded as a chain of integrators functioning such that each starts to respond only after reaction develops at the previous link and as a delay line preventing premature fixation of spurious irrelevant low probability signals. Okay, so now that's where we're talking about a um, uh, Occam's razor built into the brain. The highest links in the system serve as the ultimate signal for information fixation in non-primary areas of the neocortex. So this is where basically I think, um, let me continue forward but, uh, uh, after this, but I think that this is where, you know, as, a, as something becomes habituated, you basically have an efficiency of, of neural functioning. So in, in other words, more habituation leads to more efficiency, less, uh, less is necessary to deal with something that is habituated. And so basically by increasing uh, latent inhibition, in other words, not really noticing things, but going according to the plan and marking things as spurious and irrelevant, uh, makes it makes for more in, uh, efficient functioning. So therefore, it's basically uh, when when systems are stable, reducing complexity down to and simplifying things is the superior strategy because it leads to efficiency. However, it's not the superior strategy when things are changing. So, all right. Um, the highest links in the system serve as the ultimate signal for information fixation in non prairie primary areas of the neocortex. Um, it is probable that the ultimate assumptions of the map schema hierarchy de derived from exploration fixed through repetition are precisely those governing the rules of social interaction encoded at the highest level in our explicit conceptions of natural rights. It is these okay. universal rules, after all, that best specify right. the nature of peaceful, productive, shared territory. So what he's saying is that the highest links in the system, um, he thinks it is probable that the ultimate assumptions of the map schema hierarchy derived from exploration. So the, map, the ultimate assumptions of the map schema hierarchy, he's saying, and hi the hierarchy of the map schemas, he's also saying of the social hierarchy, mm -hmm. that's his assumption. Uh, derived from exploration, fixed through repetition, are precisely those governing the rules of social interaction encoded at the highest level in our explicit, explicit conceptions of natural rights. So what he's saying is that our idea of personal rights and those sorts of things come from habituated and re uh, repeated um, uh, yeah, use of and interaction of these schemas in social situations. 
and the uh, and so there's an ultimate assumption of the uh, the map schema hierarchy, and so that kind of that kind of makes sense because a lot of times people, when they're used to a monarchy or something, they mm -hmm. feel like the monarchs deserve it. You know, they're like it, they they have this. Yeah, they find a way to be at peace with it. Right, they're they're kind of at peace with if this if the situation is stable, then sta stability is desirable, and so and therefore they will maintain that stability by kicking out any revolutionary. Exactly, and so therefore that's how you have people who who even if. Until the until the 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 oligarchs and things like that become until they come for you, they're not gonna they're right. not gonna care. Well, until the, it's <laughs> it's so onerous that it's not survivable. The right. habituation itself means that it is a that it is something that is desirable because it is habituated because it is stable. And right. if it is stable, it is therefore desirable because of the efficiency. And it all goes down to very neural, you know, to the base to the neural yeah. base neural level and our ideas of rights and privilege and things like that come from experience of our social system and so that's how that some people who are you were know, born in a very you know where they're where they're they're born as slaves and the, and the people who are ab above them they feel like that's the way things are the way that they should be and uh, because it's what they've experienced and it's and it's the way it's always been and you know there's that, that has neural roots and whereas those who are the um Rule breakers are stirring things up. Well, they're causing a tremendous amount of upheaval and, and anxiety and, uh, you know, problems. So that's that's very interesting. And then the next section is the, the balance between order and chaos, meaning in its redemptive form. So I'm sure he's going to talk about the necessity. The uh, Now he's finally going to get to Kuhn, which is the uh, why it is that revolution is an absolute necessity. Why revolution repeatedly occurs in, in all of these various complex systems because they eventually always uh, start and trend towards there's kind of an entropy to them that they trend towards no longer being um, uh, capable of fitting the new situation of, of reality because reality continues to change mm -hmm. and, st and and reality itself is not stable uh, and so therefore the stability of the system is built in um, what's it called uh, obsolescence mm -hmm. uh, so our, our desire for stability is a valuable thing but stability is built in absolute obsolescence matter of fact in ghost in the shell there, uh, there, there was actually a statement that was that goes along with this. What was it? It was um, the, show or the movie, the actual the movie. It's like it? uh, spe specialization. Uh, and specialization is um, damn it. What was that quote? It was great. You. It's bread and weakness. Uh, yeah. So they talk oh, about. Oh, that's a medium article. No, don't click on it. I don't want to use up my. <laughs> Uh, oh, it's me. That's the medium article again. Yeah, yeah over specialize and you breed in weakness. Yeah, and that's what there it is. Specialization is strength until it's weakness. And you breed in weakness. Yep, over sp over specialize and you breed in weakness. Yes, that that is. These uh, are some of the most iconic words from Mamoru Oshii's 1995 sci-fi classic Ghost in the Shell. If you haven't seen Ghost in the Shell, or if you haven't even seen it recently, you should watch it again. It's a very good. Movie. Oh, this might be a free uh, article. Sweet. Oh, that's good. I'm gonna link that if I like it. I'm gonna read it. Yeah. Like specialization it, is is strength. Specialization is weakness. It is both. Yep. It's it is a time dependent, context dependent, scale dependent. Um, uh, what's it called? I won't call it a paradox. It is a. Uh, uh, it's a mutual duel. It's uh we we have these Life. yeah these dualities uh, all throughout nature it's and a and it. And it is the cycle between the two parts of the of mutual duels that pumps all of these homeostasis systems and allows them to to work. But eventually, revolution is something that is either there are these uh, state transitions where a, a system hits a threshold and has to have a state transition uh, for it to, to continue. So, um, okay, if you want to uh, use this as our break point, because the next the next episode is going to be point. the balance between order and chaos, meaning and it's ridiculous. And I hope he gets into the cycles and all that sort of thing. And, and I, I, I guarantee he's going to start talking about Kuhn at this point. The read is going to be short and sweet, which should leave a nice, good time uh, for discussion and then a really good long chunk for after show next Monday. Uh, we will be recording the after show because uh, I'd like to hear everybody's... Um, 
input. Oh yeah, on, sure. That sounds this, like fun. On this uh, topic. Let's do um, it. And I would like to open up the floor to questions while also looking over some of the chat. Anything in particular that I see? Yeah, it's a good idea. Go over some of the chat. Do people match with and stick to people they know, understand, and can identify and map match? Oh, yeah, that explains the in-group and out-group preference. Yeah. Uh, and once again, all of it really leads back to the idea that we, sh we function best in small groups. Mm -hmm. And something that I was talking about during a patron bath show, where I was like, look at our body, we're all unified, but all the brain cells are doing one thing, all the liver cells are doing one thing, all of those small groups are unified in their goal, their purpose, their mm -hmm. behavior, their a hive mind, and, and also, but it's tiny and functional. So, but talking about a specialization and, uh, and non-specialization and uh, the idea of uh, fluctuating hierarchy, I think women uh, in general developed with the ability to deal with a, a very fluctuating hierarchy and fluctuating situations. I think men are more specialists, mm -hmm. that they specialize in something and stick to it, and then they need more hierarchy, a, a more, stab more stability, more hierarchy to work the way that they do, which is more like an army, more like you know hunters going in their specific roles, and they specialize in their roles, whereas women, I think, a lot of times are more generalist. Therefore, who where you are in the hierarchy is going to be very dependent upon the situation, mm -hmm. and so therefore the hierarchy is going to change a lot. They're going to have a lot of varying map schemas for hierarchy so they're always going to feel like they're at the top because they're at the top in their and you know they can end up at the top and they're fluctuating you know fairly rapidly through all these various states of well in this specific position she's in charge in this specific position i'm in charge and we have all these things like when we're getting this kind of berry or whatever or we when did we're when we were gastro when we're raising kids there's you know different yeah there's there's a a changing and fluctuating hierarchy and so and so therefore there i think female brains may have adapted to fluctuating hierarchies more and therefore you know more they're fluctuating to fluctuate hierarchies right and fluctuating yeah. schemas uh because the, and, and, and they're i think they're maybe better at generalization than men are and but of course that leads to the generalization and specialization of the species in terms of talking about a variety of mammals or from a variety of animals and uh also how do we reconcile the natural world world versus the social world Remember mm -hmm. going back to the beginning, status is the most important thing, like going back to that mm -hmm. whole thing, like individual versus group. We're general always in groups, but also men somehow tend to, as, as Egregious Charles pointed out, uh, they tend to work in an environment that seeks order in the natural world, while women seek a type of order in a social world. Yeah, so what yeah is, exactly. You know, I mean, men, men, that? Yeah, <laughs> men are more, more focused on the physical world, and, and uh, women are more focused on the mental world a lot of times when it comes to the hierarchy and situation and the landscape of it. So why though, you know, because like well, it probably has just has to do with the way that we ended up developing. I mean, it's uh, you see it in. Um, I don't think you see as much of it in some. Uh, I suppose certain primates that are female bonded, they have the the female managing the social hierarchy while the men do the fighting and the protecting. And I think that's when they're when they're more uh, sexually dimorphic though. In other words, like primates that are more yes, sexually dimorphic, the males right. are more responsible for the, the fighting and protection. And they're, they're the ones that when, when some predator comes up, it's their responsibility to go fucking either, look, either die or kill whatever the fuck exactly. came Exactly, and I'm really sorry. I, I love you all, my, my conservative, uh, simple, lovely, lovely men, but the more traditionalist a man is, the more gynocentric he is. It's oh, yeah. just, so, I'm so sorry, guys, but it's no, true. No, it's true. Uh, the, the, the more sexually the more, demor demorphic. The more brute, big, gigantic, masculine a dude is, the easier he is controlled by women. Like, yeah, he's too, they're, they're completely controlled. Usually usually the simple dudes, are they have no idea. They think they're, they're, so, like, they're so in control, and they're the most completely and utterly controlled. And we're talking about like very like no no nuance, not very you know well read. Like we're we're, we're talking about exceptions versus rules. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, we're talking about extremities here. Right, it's right. like you're you're bros. You know, you you dude, dude bros. bros, dude bros. They're like, yeah, I'm so like in, in, in charge. It's like, man, yeah, they're she... the most not in charge. Exactly. Holy crap, they're so utterly and controlled. And often, basic bitches are the most uh, quote unquote feminist, histrionic, uh, manipulative in, in ways, and you know. Maintaining their female dominance. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it's just, it's funny how it's like, you know, when you look at, when you look at primates, that when, when there's the, you have the big male primate, they, they're, they, they are there at the behest of the female group. 
In other words, they, he looks like he's big and strong, but... Uh, because he has the backing of the females in that person. Exactly. And he can get kicked out quite easily, and they do very frequently. The, uh, the, those, those large males uh, a lot of times are, ki- are kicked out and re- get replaced by once they are no longer capable of, uh, well, of, of uh, carrying out the role that the females Well, also going uh, back to the, alpha, the actual alpha male thing, uh, sometimes when you have a, uh, an alpha male who is actually not a good leader, where he does punish his... Because the... If you a listen, real alpha is right. one that's fair and just. If and, you listen to yeah. the guy who actually coined the term, uh, a real alpha male in a primate society has two jobs, conflict resolution and comfort. Literally a daddy. And the way he comfort resolves uh, between females, always, because they're the ones fighting. Uh, <laughs> well, there's just a what it is. There. But frequently, and he, do, and he completely impartially uh, breaks up a fight. So he is very King Solomon in that sense. He will split that baby in half. He has no side mm-hmm. uh, when it comes to separating females. And the other thing he does is comfort those who are in distress. Uh, So that's a real alpha male. However, you have alpha males that don't end up uh, ruling for a very long time when they're bullies or uh, something else. They uh, they get they get killed. They get taken out. Yeah. Uh, There's some yeah. There's some chat there that that we probably should pay attention to. uh, I can't see from here. (laughs) Uh, Constant struggle. Frankly, it's a constant struggle for me not to be too easily manipulated. Yeah, it's. I feel like it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a testosterone thing. I well, don't there's, know, man. There, and, and that's the thing. Like, I, I believe that it's important to – there's a shared hierarchy between men and women that I think is important to, to recognize. Like, I, I assent to her control. In other words, there, is the, there, are level, there are points in which I know that she is – doing things for control and i grant that that she has she needs to have control in certain things and it's important for me to recognize that you are granting me that control that i'm not just taking it because you're some you know chum yeah yeah don't steal a gift and that's the thing is like and i think good relationships are just like a taxi driver and a passenger you know the the passenger doesn't go up there and grab the grab a hold of the wheel and but who's in control of the car well you can believe that the passenger is completely in control, or you can believe that the driver is completely in control, but they are both in control of the car. And just there is a one's it's in just, control of destination, the other one's in control of exactly how to get exactly there. how to get there. And so, and, and so the driver should be the one who's vetoing what roads to take, and the backseat driver needs to just accept that the the driver is going to get them where they're going, uh, uh, because they're the ones who de- 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 determined. The goal, the end point. And so there's a there is different I'll... sharing of responsibilities like that in the control of something that is not it's a it's a tangled hierarchy. I will also argue that sometimes in in, in our case it's actually the opposite. In yeah. a proper better relationship, the driver is deciding the destination because it's the best place for us to be. While the backseat passenger, me, is saying, Hey, look at all the pretty roads, let's go down that way. There's flowers there, yay. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> So it's, a, it's it's a little more complex. You're right. But, it just depends on who's the who's the the leader. You know. Right. Yeah. And so I and so I end up taking a lot of detours. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> exactly. And this is really funny because I'm the worst navigator ever. So you're constantly having to U-turn. Oh my god! I'm In reality, <laughs> the lo- the number of times that we U-turn. Where she's That's su- why we're always late. <laughs> she's supposedly handling the navigation. Like she's got the the freaking navigation thing in her hand. And we U-turned like a thousand times per trip. It's it's constantly U-turned. My theory of mine isn't the, the strongest, all right? Right. She does I not enter. know what you need to know. Right. <laughs> and when you need to know. God. <laughs> Without just like inducing empathy, which is not a, an automatic thing. I have to like consciously induce empathy as part of my Asperger's. Yeah. So it's, so it's just a matter of like what the biggest problem I think that we've had in, in our recent civilization is recognizing that hierarchies are not all that they seem from the outside in a simplistic view of them. There are, I mean, yeah, there's the army in which the, the, you really do have no fucking say if there's somebody over you. That is an exception. That's not the way that, you know, personal hierarchies and things like that should or, or often do really exist. But when we try to create that sort of hierarchy, it ends up a lot of times flipping. I mean, I think a lot of times the guys that are more brutish attempt to create a strong, you know, a a hyper strong, you get no decision, I make all decision uh, type of hierarchy. And then then they end up being manipulated, which is, I think uh, there's kind of a solution to that that happened in nature as well, where women have always been able to 
uh, outfoxed the more brutish guys. In other words, they had physical, they had physical dominance, and then the women established mental dominance. They they did it through psychology, uh, and so they were able to trump men's power because uh, because they were able to outfox them. And so it's the um, I, I think there is a there when there when there's not a fight between the two. Uh, uh, struggling for for dominance, but instead sharing the hierarchy of control, and, and so that it's a it's control as a group instead of control. Uh, you know, each individual vying for control. I think you end up can, you can end up creating a real a situation where two can become one. And I think that that's the that part of our of uh, our our narrative in modern society is that hierarchy is only this one brutish type of hierarchy, and that there isn't this other kind of hierarchy. Where quite obviously there is. There are you know, just because uh, one, one of the things that we started using long ago was was, uh, you know, Captain Picard and, uh, yeah. and and number one, you know, he could have had his own command. He could have had his own command and he still res- and, and he still respects. You know, it's not it's not that Picard is over him in any real way. It's that they just simply have divided you know the uh, their their responsibilities. You know that's he all. He is comfortable being you know the the sort of general manager to and the people person because that's what he ends up frequently doing is number two, and he prefers and number one, no, not number two. Number one. <laughs> uh, Austin Powers is in my head, <laughs> and Picard is just happens to be the kind of leader that Riker chooses to have. Right, There's, and it makes him no less. He's not. In other words, the hierarchy is 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 um, virtual. It, it's only a situation. It's a, number, it's a division of labor is all it is. And it allows one to specialize, uh, you know, in, in specific things. But the thing is, when also you the are... responsibility of commands. Like right, that. exactly. It's like when you're the driver, when you're the taxi driver, guess what? You, you may have control of all the little decisions, you know, along the way. But it's also your responsibility if you get in a wreck. It's also... You know, on your head, if you you make the wrong decision and it takes longer to get there, there's all these you know there's there's positives and negatives to every role that might be played, and and there's a tremendous amount of benefit to being to being able to be the passenger in the taxi and say I want to go there, and then now I'm going to hold you responsible when you fuck it up, and you know there's a, the, even, they don't they may look like from the outside oh well that person in the back doesn't get to decide where to you know how to make every decision they don't get to reach over and pull on the steering wheel and slam on the brakes whenever they feel like it they get, they're at the they're at the whim of that driver it's like well are they though are they at the whim of the driver yeah their life is in their hands yeah their safety is in their hands yeah there's a lot of things that they don't get to make the decision and it's not up to them whether or not to hit the brakes or to go through a, a yellow light or you know any of those sorts of things and one might want to have all of those those things, but that's just not realistic. You you have to be able to divide labor. You have to be able to work as a group. And part of working as a group is having these hierarchies that are of convenience, and they're not they're not real per se. They they are they are much more tangled and more complex. Yeah. When you attempt to make them too too hierarchical, things do fuck up. There are problems with the way that the army doesn't allow individuals to make their own decisions. That they have no bottom up. Decision yeah, making, and, and yeah, well, not <laughs> not necessarily the Holocaust, but sometimes yeah. you end up d- killing innocents, and, right, and so and just that's following why following orders has its issues. Right, right, it does because the people at the top may not have the information necessary from the people at the ground, and so if people just follow orders too much, things fucking go wrong. Yeah. And so there's there there's times when orders have to be disobeyed, when the hierarchy has to be broken. There are yeah. times. When that is an absolute necessity, and I think because that's what women specialize for breaking up hierarchies. Yeah, well, or, or disobey. Yeah, right. <laughs> we're just watching extinction. But, no, but you're talking about breaking up. I'm talking about breaking. No, breaking hierarchies, breaking yeah. up a hierarchy. I was talking about situationally oh, breaking the hierarchy for that moment, not ah, gotcha. fundamentally destroying see, the hierarchy. Yes, yes. So that's what we're having more focus on. Thank you. Right. And um, also, I, I really think it's interesting that we have. Uh, I, I think it's a very powerful but unspoken thing that women determine our future based on who they breed with. Oh yeah, like, they are the select. They are the insane. sexual selectors. They are that's selecting. Insane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How much of a, a men have no say about that shit. Yep. About exactly. the, the, the future continuation, they they have a say about their fitness level to an extent in the moment. I mean, but there's some. Sometimes there's. I there's mean, men a, pick females too, but for the most part, they they take whatever they can get. Well, you know, one one of the things I've noticed is that that's why men, they disseminate everything. Men are the selectors of uh, of like physical uh, things a lot of times. In other words, they uh, men 
uh, very strongly, especially when they're younger, do not want to breed with physically unfit. Right. Whereas women are much uh, more way more flexible flexible about, about that. that. Whereas women are extremely inflexible about mentally unfit. Mm. Where, and whereas men, uh, they don't give a shit. But they'll about stick their dick and crazy, no problem. Yeah, exactly. Uh, hot, or stupid. The hot or, crazy matrix. Yeah, but sure. there's also stupid, or right. you know, they don't they don't really care. And so therefore, the selectors of the mind a lot of times are women, whereas the selectors of the body are the men. And so there's an interesting, um, you know, yeah, share a d division of labor there as well. Complic they're complicit in there. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, of course, it's, it's very general. It's like, you know, a lot of times men do care about mind to a certain extent. Women yeah, do care about, about body to a certain extent. Yeah, patterns over yeah. hundreds uh, of thousands of years. Yeah, and, uh, and over a very large sample size. <laughs> yes, yes. Extremely large sample size. Extremely you know, general rule. Greater than 50%. Okay. 51. <laughs> right. 51 and above. And that's a really, really general rule. What's that? Oh yeah, the loss of yeah. I think there's just a disconnect. Yeah, oh. it looks like a disconnect. Yeah, I, yeah. I think the, the the stream itself disconnects every once in a while. All right. So, um, are there any other? Did you want to read the um, the what's it called? Mm -hmm. uh, I've chat. incorporated some of the chat. Uh, okay, good. As we were talking, but so let's see. There's an extent to which the environment men work in. Oh, natural world, right? Um, also, why I don't fit in most hierarchical groups, I look for things to change, so things get disrupted, and force things to improve. Yeah, the bane of every non-neurotypical girl. We do not <laughs> fit into groups <laughs> <laughs> all that often. Uh, oftentimes, male groups actually tend to be more accepting of weird females mm -hmm. than female groups are accepting of weird females. Oh, there's a whole, we could do a whole, whole show about rule breaking and women's desire for both the, uh, the rebel as well as the uh, hierarchy the maintainer, right? The people who maintain hierarchy and the people who uh, break hierarchy and how, how that has a, uh, a sexual um, attraction to both of those. Interesting. ...that most aspects of human evolution are based on survival. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah in fact, it is the core one. And uh, you frequently like to, to bring up that, uh, anal not analogy, but I guess uh, a thought experiment of when a mother is feeding his child, is it maximizing his genes or is it doing something extremely loving and caring and self-sacrificing? It is both. It is both. Just because we think of the, the mechanics underneath That's as ugly frame. doesn't mean it's actually ugly. It's, it's just that, that we hate to see see the reality of things. We want to keep our magical ideations about stuff. Because then we can Be lie to ourselves and each other easier. <laughs> yeah. but, the, but the truth of the matter is, things that are beautiful are dead cold mechanics also. They're yeah. both. Uh, and whenever you – the one thing that if I could get across to people in general – that's really important is understanding that morality and love and all of those things are the solution to a problem. A dead, cold, mechanical hyperintelligence would eventually come to the solution of these problems that reality has come to the solution of with creating systems of love, systems of, uh, of morality. Those things would eventually emerge as the solution to the problem of a changing existence. That's that is what it is. It's a solution. It's not, and so therefore, whenever we we can find the cold, dead, ugly, you know, mechanics and logic to all those things we see as beautiful, or we can just decide to see them as beautiful. But we need to be able to be okay with both. Yeah, they are both beautiful and both and just cold, dead mechanics. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, um, as Tangle Graven pointed out, different social groups produce different gender roles. Uh, that is very true in the sense that what you just said, of, or what we'll be talking about selecting for mental things versus physical things, I uh, will get back to that in just a sec, but I do want to point out the fact that in third, second and especially third world countries, um, the um, it is actually existence of privilege, uh, of, of wealth of a country that allows women to not pursue STEM and things like that. And it is in countries where there are not that many resources, where people are struggling, where people have to do something with their lives to, um, they need, uh, that's where women go into STEM willingly in mm -hmm. second and third world countries because they know that that is the only way to increase their social rank. But when everything is stable and good and you have a lot of resources, then women relax and go into helping jobs. 
they don't they don't want to go into STEM. It is sort of a necessity thing. And then on top of that, uh, growing up, uh, I I am from post Soviet, well pre and post Soviet Eastern Bloc, uh, Eastern Europe, and I was trained not only as a girl. Um, and other girls in my class, for instance, one of the things we did in math that I like to talk about in sixth grade, we opened up each math class with a problem being on the board and everybody racing to solve it. And I was almost once first, except it was always this other girl who was first. So we had women actually competing with each other in STEM ways, uh, which is sort of unheard of in, in U.S. And nobody made us do it. It's, it was just part of our culture. But I would say that the reason why women would, would tend to shy away from STEM and things like that is because of the level of persistence mm -hmm. required in certain As things. I think, that, I think that I think women uh, have a lower dopamine system than men do. Men are more easily satisfied. Therefore, things that would be boring to women are, are satisfying to men. Yeah. Uh, women need more frequent dopamine features. Right. Well, it's. I think they they are just less. They're they are less sensitive to dopamine, mm -hmm. which is why, of course, when you look at the sexual difference in uh, and the ability to have an orgasm, that's related mm -hmm. to dopamine sensitivity as well. Uh, and that's why men just, oh, you know, can yeah, yeah, something rubs against it. And they, they, have, they come just thinking about coming. You know, like, <laughs> uh, whereas for hard. women, it takes a lot more, uh, you know, to, to achieve that because of a lower, they have, they're, they're more, they're more sensitive to serotonin, et cetera. And so I think there's this kind of an, not an ax, uh, I guess an axis sort of where there's a, where you can become more of a, a serotonin, serotonergic system or a more dopaminergic system and the sensitivity to one versus the other is, is a categorical of certain you know very general um very generally systems whether or not you want to be persistent mm -hmm. and push through or you want to be more examining and comparative and i think words. that's also uh, oftentimes cultural yeah um for instance uh, once again growing up russian um we had you know we we were driven to excellence um, by for whatever, whatever reason we were, but it's like we fucking wanted to go to space. We wanted to win at the Olympics. We wanted to be excellent in every way that a human could be excellent in. And we, you know, um, and at the same time, I think that's part of the culture because growing up, and to me, still, I, being in America shows me how different I am compared to this culture. Mm -hmm. But back at home, it was normal where intelligence is sexy, nerdiness. Men who are academics, that's hot. Mm -hmm. That's not what necessarily people believe in the U.S. Uh, yeah. You know, so it's, it's definitely culture affects. Um, yeah, a lot uh, of these but things. I bet culture also will uh, will express itself in the dominance of specific genes, and I and I d bet dollars to donuts that uh, in cultures where the women are more sexually active and uh things like that that they have a stronger dopamine system uh Russian? yeah <laughs> and, and it, so therefore they're more male-like in the, their brain systems than that's than in I cultures where myself a, a, a half klingon because russian women and men we're raw exactly <laughs> and then therefore more male-like which mm -hmm. means a little less of the the things that women do mm -hmm. in other words so in other words they're, they're missing some of the soft uh think it through don't don't uh push against it but instead step back and reconsider that goes along with that th going towards that side versus push through and you know stay the course stay the course in, in which staying the course and pushing through guess what that's conflict when two people are staying the course and pushing through and they're and they're they've, they've got any kind of difference between right. them and so therefore that breeds conflict and so there's Social conflict. Right, social conflict, exactly. And so I think that you'll end up finding that, and I think that's why in every television show, if a girl has any sexuality to her at all, any, any, she's automatically the bad guy. Except and, for Better Than Us. Uh, that Russian show has at least three women that are sexual, and they're awesome. <laughs> they're yeah. good girls. And I think, well, <laughs> and I think it's because of the fact that people perceive those who are willing to push through harder as being more... Villainous. They're they're they they are they're causing strife. And it's like, well, I mean, that they're, they're part of a system that is important, which is which, staying the course, the is, pushing though, through to 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 the you know pushing past the difficulty. But you know, there's a time when when pushing past is nothing but conflict and unnecessary when you need to be working together. But so. speaking of television, when you personally have the the blonde cooperative women, they end up being extremely socially manipulative. Oh God, yes. Um, and not very fair or just or and not just and, and and instead of direct aggression they're passive aggressive yeah 
Yeah. And, oh, and uh, I think let's uh, leave off with one last comment uh, that I, I think I disagree with. <laughs> um, emotions are an adaptation of logic. Uh, no. Emotions were oh. first. Logic came next. Uh, I well, think okay. he, or at least they're two branches. But yeah. I definitely think that it's an extreme, what extreme they mean is from misunderstanding a to think that humans uniquely have emotion. No, fucking monkeys have emotion. Humans have logic. Monkeys yeah. don't have logic. What they're talking about, though, is that there is a pure rationale to the way that reality works. In other words, mm. the development of life itself. I mean, I like see. going back to at the cellular level. Just also, the logic that, of chaos manipulation. Right, right, exactly. So, so in other words, just... When the first single-celled organism had in it the desire to get what makes it persist, ah. which is is in its I physiology and yeah, has no neurons at all, it's like uh, you know. It the, is essentially <laughs> there's a impulse that is purely logical. It, it must reproduce, yeah, exactly. survive, and right. then your so brain rationality. is like, I want love. I want sex. Yes, I the idea love. of logic is uh, it, the the word logic carries some baggage to right, it. Right, and I'm misunderstood. Yes. Right. And and that is that yeah you know, we have this these ideas of logic but it's just there's pure rationality reason logic all those words point to something yeah. that has to do with mechanics it right. really is it's it's mechanics a robot and information is right objective. something fitting to something else is what it comes down to and it, I mean I would call it mechanics that's one right. of the reasons why I I despise the numerologists who call themselves mathematicians these days mm -hmm. because they are not they do not They're hail not back they no and not just that they don't hail back to the geometers <laughs> they uh, uh, the uh, the 19th century geometers are uh, are the ones who who granted us uh, the connection between physics and mathematics and now we have people who are the followers of Dirac who believe that mathematics by itself is is its own is a is its own end and that made them into made people into um, numerologists and so we have a numerology sort of uh, view of that that reality is math no reality is mechanics uh, it is not math math is a representation of mechanics mm -hmm. it's a very good representation of mechanics but there is a things going against other things that, that, that geometers understood better. Geometry is the is the language it's of an the universe, right? The geometry, one one. <laughs> and not the math that represents geometry, but geometry itself, How it shape fits together, and, yeah. and and fitting together and things moving against each other are the, uh, are more the basis of the universe than math is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But okay, that was uh, I'll get off my the, my soapboxes. Let me unstrap the soapboxes I keep strapped to my feet, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, <laughs> I think we're we're pretty good for like. Touching on some of the the chat, um, and yeah. uh, you wanted to do. Did you want to do an after show today? Is that what we're doing, or we're trying to kind of mix yeah, the two and then to do the after, exactly. a big after show? Yes, yeah, so that and the record. finalization of this paper. Yes, yeah. So we can we can have the max amount of context we can. Have yes. finished the paper. Yeah, hopefully, <laughs> and, and hopefully he'll have kind of a summary and try right, to exactly. uh, weave everything together. And I would also like to record it, so like I want to have it, uh, you know. So ne so following Monday, the fourteenth, um, five p.m. Pacific. We're going to be back here to read the last five, four to five pages, and then we'll go into the after show with our patrons um, afterwards, and we'll record that, and that will be available for patrons only on uh, Challenger and higher mode, uh, higher rewards here on Patreon. Uh, however, this live show that we just did will be available, and all the previous ones, the, the 35 plus, almost 40. Cherry time shows we've done uh, are all available on patreon.com slash Anna Cherry Pu public posts. There's a Cherry Stem tag you can click on that'll give you everything, and they are audio files that you can download, as well as uh, there should be an RSS link in the description of this video um, that you can put into a player and um, basically be updated on, to, on our episodes that way. Uh, I am working towards being able to host our podcast on Libsyn, which theoretically should lead to being able to put it on Spotify and everywhere else, which is my absolute dream for this project. Uh, I also probably need to actually create cherrystem.live, because currently right now it's just a link to Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> but I've, I've been a little uh, behind in my webmistressing uh, for, for the porny stuff, so now i got to get into this. <laughs> And I'll, I'll try to have that done at some point, hopefully by the end of the month, but no promises. <laughs> However, these episodes are available on Patreon within a week or less of when they're uh, live here, so you can go check them out. And then we will see you all next Monday, and we'll talk to our patrons afterwards and have a fun little sort of discussion. 
And yeah, I believe uh, that is all we have for today. Um, that'll be some fun songs to sing us out. And yep, that's it. Awesome. So thank you all for your views and your discussion. It was a bustling chat today. I really enjoyed that. Uh, I tried to... Uh, a lot of it was just commentary along with what we're saying, but anything that I thought was interesting. And, and feel to free to in. battle it out in the, in the comments, right? <laughs> yes, yes. If you disagree with anything we have said, leave a comment and tell us how And don't Biden forget to like and subscribe it. and all those other things you're supposed to say in videos, right? Yes. <laughs> um, I, oh, yeah. No, it's true, actually. Uh, the subscribe thing. It's just a click of a mouse for you, but it actually makes a difference for us. Uh, because, you know, um, sponsors and shit like that, they look at the number of followers you have. So, it will probably you know. never be responsible because I curse too much. And I do porn. And yeah. you do porn. Uh, and we do porn. So we'll never get any money from that. But hey, might as well get people uh, uh, viewing our stuff and enjoying it exactly. regardless. So. <laughs> exactly. The more viewers you have, the more engagement there is, the more it's likely to be recommended. So it's just a click of the mouse for you, but it actually can make a difference for this show. So let's do that. Uh, if you guys feel up for it. If not, no worries. <laughs> And yes, we shall see you next Monday. Uh, we'll see our patrons in the after show. Uh, feel free to uh, chat in the Cherry Stem room. We will be uh, around the computer and the chat for the next 20, 30 minutes or so. So uh, Check in occasionally. Check, we will, we'll be checking in. We can continue the conversation in chat on Discord. Thank you again. And we'll see you all next Monday. Bye. Bye. <laughs>